All right, Mr. Warden, we are now live. Excellent, thank you very much. And I wanna say, there we go. So good morning and welcome to everyone. It's uh, now September 23rd, and I will call this uh, meeting of County Council uh, to order. I wanna welcome everyone. Uh, it's, uh, boy, we've had a few days of uh, fairly heavy rain, and uh, I can tell you that uh, I, I pulled out my rubber boots, which I used on a daily basis when I was on the farm, but uh, I still keep them around for occasions just like this. Um, <clears throat> Madam Clerk, roll call, uh, please. Certainly, Ms. Warden. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have all members in attendance with the exception of uh, Councillor Soever and Mackey. They have sent their regrets and their alternates were unable to attend in their, in their place. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next is our land acknowledgement. And so I'll say that we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Anishinaabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors signed treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and the Inuit, whose ancestors shared this land and these waters. May we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. Okay, council, is there any uh, declaration of interest, pecuniary or otherwise? I see no hands and I would just say if one does come up during the course of the meeting, I would ask you to declare it at that time. Item number five, um, we are looking for adoption of minutes starting with 5A, adoption of the minutes dated September 9th, um, <clears throat> Council and Committee of the Whole. That's moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Any discussion on those? Uh, seeing none, I will call the question. Is there anyone opposed? And seeing none, I'm gonna say that is carried, thank you. Um, 5B is the uh, to adopt the uh, development charges a minute dated September 13th. That's moved by Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor Carlton. Is there any discussion on those? <clears throat> and no discussion. I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? That too is carried. Item 5C is the Long-Term Care Committee of Management minutes. Uh, dated September 14th. That's moved again by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Klumpus. Any discussion? And once again, seeing none, I'm gonna call the question. Is there anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? No hands showing. I'm gonna say that that too is carried. Item 5D, 5 excuse me, is the Long-Term Care Committee of Management closed uh, minutes. Um, and that is moved by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Klumpus. Um, I'm gonna assume that there's no discussion, otherwise we'd have to go into closed session. Anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? And there are no hands, so I'm gonna say that too is carried. Let's scroll down a little bit here. Uh, item six is uh, if we have any closed meeting matters and there are none. Uh, item seven is good news and celebrations. Uh, Councillor Potter, you're first. Uh, thank you, Warden. And uh, just a couple of uh, items. Uh, one is that the Brew Mountains Public Library is entering the, entering the second phase of their strategic planning study. Uh, they have about 800 people so far who have provided feedback in short conversations and starting next month, uh, we call it the GLAM because it's a gallery library, uh, uh, and art uh, gallery and the, uh, and the, the uh, library itself, as well as the museum will be bringing uh, focus groups with 18 scheduled so far. Uh, and uh, so it's a highly comprehensive study over the next four years, which will inf inform the next four years and beyond uh, for services. Uh, and uh, we'll see the uh, results of that uh, with some of the progress coming up in the upcoming uh, issue of the Blue Mountains Review. The other thing I wanted to bring up is a little more concerning. It's the uh, some localized flooding 
uh, we have in the prices uh, development and and Montero Road area over around Blue Mountain around Craig Lee. Uh, we're seeing some flooding there reported by our operation staff and uh, also in some of the rural areas. So uh, so far all the ditches are are running full and problem free, but uh, they're being monitored throughout the day today as the rain continues. I know that uh, some of the other municipalities in gray are are experiencing similar issues. So I just uh, caution the public uh, and the rest of council and staff to be careful as they go about their business today that there may be some flooding issues. Uh, and uh, given the weather forecast, I don't think it'll get any better in the next day or two. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Good words of advice. Uh, Councillor Keaveney, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden and good morning, County Council. I think everyone is aware of the struggles businesses are facing these days in securing and retaining enough staff. So uh, in partnership with the Deeper Chamber of Commerce, RTO7, Employment Ontario, and Y Employment Services is hosting a job fair. This will take place at our community centre on October the 7th between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, there's many part-time, full-time, seasonal, and student positions available, and we encourage any job seekers to register at YMCA, um, owensound.on.ca slash Meaford Job Fair uh, to guarantee a spot to, uh, to come in and uh, speak to the businesses who will be attending, and proof of vaccination uh, will be required when you come into our community centre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Keegan. Do you mind giving that uh, website uh, once more, a little bit more slowly? Um, absolutely, Mr. Warden. So the website would be ymcaowensound.on.ca slash Meaford Job Fair. Excellent. Thank you very much. Councillor. My pleasure. You're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, uh, County Council. Uh, just want to say that uh, we're welcome, uh, welcome out to Landing Gear Diner. Um, they had their grand opening yesterday at the Saugeen Municipal Airport. Chef Crystal was there. She, um, I think she has three family members that are helping them, but uh, I think uh, I know Mayor Patterson was out. We enjoyed uh, just the, the grand opening there, but uh, all the best to her success. She is going to be open Tuesday to Sunday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, as a start, and then uh, we'll revisit the hours as uh, things develop. Thank you. Thank you, and all the success to that uh, restaurant operation. I know it does help to attract uh, pilots to the airport. Uh, Councillor Body, you're next. Good morning, um, Warden Hicks and, and Council. Uh, next Thursday, as we all know, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and this did come up a little bit short for all of us, and I'm sure we all look forward to doing more uh, and perhaps doing better next year. Um, Council and Owen Sound chose to close down City Hall for the uh, day in recognition of that day. Um, at the Mawikwadong Friendship Center, which is in the old Dufferin School at 3rd Avenue and approximately 10th Street West, they will have a sacred fire ceremony starting at one. Uh, there will be a sacred fire and gathering at the uh, Name Wikwadong Reconciliation Garden, which is uh, just being completed at the uh, south end of Kelso Park, actually Naywash Park, but Kelso Beach. You can get to it either from the grain elevator side and across the bridge, it's right there, or, or park at Kelso, that's at three. And then also on the Saturday the 2nd, the uh, Gitche Namwe Wikwadong Garden Sculpture Installation. So this was Sturgeon Bay where uh, they are, I shouldn't say we, though the city actually contributed, are putting in a, uh, a, a statue or a, 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 a structure uh, uh, that will be a, um, a sturgeon fish in it on Saturday at 2 p.m. So I encourage everyone to come if you don't have uh, other ceremonies that you're going to in your own municipality, we'd be happy to have you come and uh, and mingle with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, et cetera, you know, from, throughout Grand Bruce here in Owen Sound. Thanks. 
Thank you very much for that, Councillor Bali. It was, uh, there are many, many things happening. I know that with the last uh, poverty task force meeting, <laughs> just hearing the many things that are happening all across uh, uh, the county, it's hard to keep up with them all. But I do know that the various municipal websites and uh, the library uh, websites is a good resource for people to go to to get information about what's happening near them. But thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Visai, you're next. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks. Um, no, well, I see Councillor McQueen has his has, has hand up, so um, I'm assuming it's the second one that he's uh, going to talk to. So I'll hold on, hold off on that. Uh, the one thing um, that I, I do want to mention, and this isn't good news or celebrations, and it, it's, it's a pretty neutral statement. Uh, as everyone knows, yesterday was when proof of vaccination came into effect. Um, uh, understandably or otherwise, there, there are a number, number of irate people all over social media, some of whom have um, taken to saying that they are looking forward to giving staff at restaurants and uh, other places a hard time over, over these demands for proof of vaccination. Uh, I do want everyone to remember that um, this is effectively something that uh, is a provincial regulation, which uh, staff at independent businesses have very little control over. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're visiting your local establishment and you're, you're seeing the staff person, they're probably someone, you know, uh, keep in mind that they're effectively just doing their job. They're following uh, regulations that have been, um, uh, provided by the province and, uh, uh, just be nice to everyone in general. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desai and Deputy Warden McQueen, you're next. Yeah, uh, good morning, County Council and uh, staff. Uh, just wanted to give you an update on our Ram Rodeo that's coming to our uh, municipality this weekend. Uh, just as of yesterday, we have over 800 tickets pre uh, sold already for the Saturday event and 461 for the Sunday. Um, and we're still a few days away. I know that we had a little bit of rain yesterday, but it looks like sun and rain clouds on Saturday and Sunday. So we're looking, hopefully it'll be a good a good day for that certainly um uh the event is as i've brought up before is uh, proceeds of this is going to the markdale hospital foundation so if you wish to attend probably sunday might be better than saturday but uh tickets are still available online uh also i thought maybe the deputy mayor might have raised it but uh we had a very successful kite fest in uh gray highlands itself and uh holy smokes i tell you i've never seen such big kites before and you've probably seen some pictures maybe on, on social media or whatever but uh, I know that uh, it was a well attended event great weather brings great people out and uh, certainly uh, it certainly did and uh, there was a number of food and craft vendors there as well and and the deputy mayor he was I think either frying something or cooking something on the, the rotary because the rotary are already there as well so maybe he may have had to add to that but uh, anyway he was working hard uh, doing what he could there. So, but yeah, very good, very well attended and uh, certainly search out um, some of those uh, maybe on social media because there was some kites that were bigger than RVs. So can you imagine uh, something that big? So it's almost like a kite. It's almost like a kite that helps pull up the big kite. It's sort of pretty amazing how, and they also had competitor uh, kite flyers and, and a number of things like that. So very successful, hoping for a, uh, a return maybe for next year and um, and uh, other than that uh, it's uh, moving on to the color time when we'll start to see a few colors uh, in our in our area and we know the beaver valley also shows very well if you're out for a drive to take a drive that way and uh, view the view the uh, colors in the next few weeks thank you mr warden thank you deputy warden and you've put a smile on my face as i go back to my childhood as a, a young boy in Guyana, uh, the kite festivals were a huge, huge deal. And I can remember as a child looking up at the sky and seeing all of those, you know, those colors, the, just the sky lit up with all the colors. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, thank you for that update. Uh, and by the way, in Gray County, we call that liquid stuff, um, liquid sunshine. Uh, we'll pray for Campbell. some for this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, Councillor Gamble, you're next. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say uh, last Saturday, we had our first annual car rally, our car show and tractor show. Uh, we had over 200 cars. 
which caught us completely off guard. We were right full and uh, we appreciate all the support we got. The funding is going for our new arena and hub. And as I said, uh, next year we're planning on an even bigger one. That's my motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Gamble. I don't see any other hands, so I'm gonna say that's probably it uh, for our good news and celebrations. Thank you everyone for sharing. The last item on our agenda is uh, a motion for adjournment, which is moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Milne. I'm gathering no one is opposed to that, so we'll take a second to move on to the Committee of the Whole. So let me get my notes together here. <clears throat> Oh, we don't need to stop, we can continue, Rob. Excellent, so I'll call the Committee of the Whole meeting uh, to order. Is there any declaration of interest uh, from anyone? Well, seeing none, I would again ask you to declare if one um, comes up during the course of the meeting. Item three is uh, business arising from the minutes. Do we have any? And item number four, uh, we have a delegation. Um, I don't know who is going to make the uh, introductions. Perhaps it's Madam CAO, but we do have uh, members uh, from Georgian College. Am I putting you on the stop on the spot, Kim? <laughs> no, not not at all. I was just um, <clears throat> looking to the clerk about the time. I wonder, yeah. Mr. Warden, um, because yeah, we do can. have a few minutes. If we could yeah. do the consent and then um, we'll be closer to the 10 o'clock time. Absolutely, yes. Thank uh, you. So we're on to item number five. We're looking at the consent uh, agenda. Is there anything from that consent agenda that needs to be told, Council? If not, then I will... <clears throat> that, that is moved actually by Councillor Hutchison and seconded by Councillor Milne. I'll call the question, is there anyone opposed? And seeing no hands, I'm going to say that that is carried. Should we go on? Maybe can we deal with the? Oh, that will probably take a little bit of time. We probably want to not deal with seven A as we've got a delegation on that. Right, and I'm not sure um, how long the. Um, the following report on the Hanover official plan would be, Randy, and, did you know? Anne Marie's report about the RGI might be a good selection. Okay, that's item with Councils, seven. yep. Is everyone okay if, if I deal with item 7C at this point? Okay, that item is moved uh, by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Keaveny. Anne Marie, you have the floor. Great, and it's actually Josh Gibson that will be presenting this report oh, okay. today. Okay, I, I did have that on my list, my apologies. <laughs> Thanks very much, Warden. Uh, good morning, Great County Council. Morning, I Josh. caught me off guard. I was getting ready for about a couple of hours from now. <laughs> uh, so this morning I have a report for you regarding a phased in increase to the maximum RGI rental costs. And the reason we're looking at this is that it's actually been over 10 years since they were last looked at. In the last couple of years, we've had a fairly significant change in the market where our maximum rents for RGI now are falling way behind the average market rents that are set by CMHC. Mm -hmm. And I will point out that those average market rents from CMHC are significantly lower than what you will actually see in the private market. Um, so it was a good time for us to bring our new rents closer to AMR and generate some additional revenue to maintain our stock. As well, the primary focus of this is to increase equity across our tenants. So we're looking at some tenants who are paying significantly less than 30% of their annual income towards the rental cost. And we want to bring it more equitable across the board. Okay. So tenants in community housing, I'll just give you a little brief overview of rent gear to income. Uh, they only pay 30% of their annual income towards their rental costs. And increasing these maximum rents will not change that. So if somebody's income does not bring them to a higher level, even with the increased maximum rents, their rent will stay at that lower value. So this is only for those people with the income to justify the change to the 30%.
And rental calculations are all legislated under the Housing Services Act, and we follow those very strictly. And we expect in 2022 that this increase will generate approximately $100,000 in additional revenue. And that increase will slow significantly over the five-year period as the maximum rents do not uh, meet the income that some of our tenants have, and they fall out of maximum rents. And there is an attached spreadsheet that I know is quite overwhelming that does outline all the changes that we're suggesting and how it's going to impact revenues. And I'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, questions from anyone? Uh, Councillor Mellon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. I'm just wondering, Josh, and thank you for the report, um, what percentage of our tenants would actually pay the maximum amount? Is there, is, there, is there trends or any method to the madness, so to speak? Yeah, so right now about 15% of our 997 units would be at maximum rent. Uh, I did look at the, as we are phasing in these new increases based on current income that our tenants have, that will decrease to around 6% of our portfolio by the end of the five-year phase-in period. Um, the other thing that this may change is that as we're increasing our maximum rents and bringing it closer to the private market, people might make the decision to move on from community housing as that gap isn't so large. And then we'll be able to fill those places with our higher target needs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Keegan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And thank you, Josh, for your presentation. I'm just wondering about the suggested $100,000 additional income to the county, will that be kind of eaten up in maintenance and uh, additional expenses or will there be funds that can actually go towards uh, creating more affordable housing? So this would be an amount that would definitely be needed for maintaining our stock. Uh, we have uh, majorly increased operating expenses. Uh, so this revenue would help to offset some of those operating expenses. Thank you. I do not see any further hands. So if that's the case, perhaps it's time to call the question on the motion to receive, to adjust the maximum rents and to approve those uh, yearly increases. Anyone opposed? Seeing no hands, I'm gonna say that that is carried. Uh, Council, I'm probably, and with your um, input, to Madam Clerk, I'm gonna suggest that we take a break perhaps and come back at 10, would that make sense? I know that that's we have- That's fine, if council that wishes that. Yeah, maybe that, that's a, a good thing to do now, give the guests a chance to uh, arrive and be on time. And uh, so we'll see you back again in six minutes uh, at 10 a.m.
Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Um, how are we doing for quorum? Just. Give me a few seconds. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you. Uh, so we're back at item uh, number four. We have uh, a few delegations. First, a delegation from uh, Georgian College and Madam CAO, perhaps you could introduce our guests. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning, Council. Um, so pleased to have join us this morning, uh, Mary Lynn Westmoyne, who's the President and CEO of Georgian College, well known to all of you, as well as Steve Lowe, who I believe many of you know, who's a board member of uh, the Board of Governors for Georgian College. So welcome to uh, Mary Lynn and to Steve. Uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and sorry for the delay Delay there. I kind of lost my screen when it switched to our presentation, but I think it's up for everyone. Kim, will you just let me know, confirm that it is up? We can see. Yes, it. You're, you're great. Yeah, that's great. Well, uh, let me begin just by thanking uh, you all. And I hear you were running a little bit ahead, and, and uh, I arrived right at 10-2, uh, and uh, good for you. Our, our board isn't normally ahead of schedule, so uh, congratulations, uh, Chair, on, on that. And let me just say uh, we're so pleased to be here with you this morning to formally address Council and to just uh, share an update on what's happening with your college. With me is Steve Lowe, a member of our Board of Governors from Owen Sound, who I invite now to say just a few words.
There we go. Thank you, Mary Lynn, and uh, good morning and greetings on behalf of Georgian College's Board of Directors. We certainly uh, very much appreciate the ability to speak to County Council this morning. It's been a pretty crazy, extraordinary 18 months at the college and the board is very much and exceptionally proud of the, the college's collective resiliency, the staff, the board management and uh, students throughout COVID. Despite the many challenges we faced, Georgian continues to thrive and our cohort uh, starting in September uh, with new and returning students uh, is about 9,000 students between the various campuses. And they're, they're uh, joining us remotely in person or uh, a hybrid or a combination of both. So it's definitely interesting times. Together, we're helping to make their academic and career goals a reality while meeting the evolving need of local industry and employers and contributing to the communities that we're proud to serve in. Um, we've, as a board and as a college, a number of strategic opportunities that we're very excited about that Mary Lynn is going to walk us through this morning. And I wanna thank personally you and the county with gratitude from the board for your continued interest and ongoing investment in the college and our students. And th thank you, and I'll pass it over to Mary Lynn. Thanks so much. Well, council, earlier this year, I know I shared uh, the results of an economic impact analysis that the college had done. It shows the college creates value in many ways, um, some of which are so easy to see and others uh, which uh, influence the lives of our students, employers, and our economy. And sometimes we don't really understand that economic impact until we do a little bit of research. This study found that our campuses contribute 1.7 billion in income to the Georgian catchment area, that's all the areas that we're in, or approximately 5.3% of the total gross regional product. That's the entire regions that Georgian are in. Of particular interest to you is the 1.4 billion of that impact is generated by our alumni. Based on data from the 2019-2020, the Owen Sound campus alone added 93.5 million in income to the Gray Bruce regional economy, or the equivalent of more than 1,300 jobs. Student spending added 1.6 million to the local economy and the impact of alumni currently employed in the county workforce amounted to 77.3 million in added income. As this impact will surely increase in the future, I will share more details later on, but Georgian is working hard to bring the region's first four year degree to our Owen Sound campus. During the pandemic, as uh, Steve alluded to, the college has uh, continued to support our students and community. We only really had to shut down totally for two weeks and came back uh, with a firm resolve to continue. This October, we'll welcome our new executive director, Dave Shorey, sorry, Dave Shorey, whose leadership and expertise will be vital in forging community partnerships. Those of you who uh, would have received my notice will know that uh, Lisa has left us um, for some personal family reasons. Among several recent achievements in our marine area, Georgian conducted the world's first blended power propulsion pilot courses using iCloud simulation. This is just incredible to see folks. Students were able to practice and troubleshoot operation of an engine power plant from their homes on a server located in Norway. Still on the Marine front this past winter, Mariners training at our facilities booked 1,152 nights at the Best Western Hotel. We estimated those participating in Marine training spend about $2 million annually in the local hospitality area. Switching to healthcare something I have a lot of passion for, and I know you do as well. Thanks to the government tuition and fee funding, we had an overwhelming response in applications to our one-time accelerated personal support worker program. That began in May at the Owen Sound campus. The program is designated to get 
PSWs out into the field more quickly due to the pandemic. As you can appreciate, their support and skills are desperately needed. Right now, we have 24 students completing paid work placements in the community. And I wanna just thank you because I know some of these are in your facilities. As part of community service learning assignments, practical nursing students assisted at the Gray Bruce Health Unit's mass immunization clinics, which was an excellent hands-on learning opportunity for our students and I think an asset to the community. And we've had a significant increase in our apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship activity. We've added five new trades in the last three years, now offering eight in total. The new pre-apprenticeship programs are in partnership with the Canadian Union of Skilled Workers and Bruce Power. We're always evolving our ways of learning and working. I could share many other campus highlights, but perhaps one of our biggest achievements was evolving the ways we learn, work, and support our partners. This is an ongoing journey for us. We know today's students expect more from their education and the pandemic has only made that more obvious and reaffirmed our commitment to ensuring flexible, experimental and technology enabled learning. Frankly, without technology, we wouldn't have been able to continue the last 19 months. Our goal is to offer students more control over their personal learning journey, letting them decide how, where, and when they will study. We know employers expect so much more from our graduates. They've expressed a need to hire grads with enhanced digital literacy, resilience, and problem solving. Almost anywhere I go, those three skills are relayed to me by employers. Higher education is so poised for disruption and Georgian is ready to take the lead on this journey. Some of our strategic priorities have evolved as a result of the pandemic. And right now we're focusing in three areas. First, digital innovation. That will enable us to offer flexible, personalized, technology-enabled learning and services throughout the student's entire life cycle. More sectors are being disrupted by technology, automation, remote work, and e-commerce. We have to equip our students with the digital skill sets they need to succeed, and in fact lead, as many industries are trying to keep current themselves. Our second priority is equity, diversity, and inclusion, and belonging. We're striving to create a learning and working environment where everyone feels seen, heard, and knows they belong. We were grateful to receive a $400,000 $400, grant in the spring from Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada to deepen our work in that area. We were only 11 grants in one of 11 grants in the country, and I understand over 480 applications. So with that grant, we've hired our first direct director to lead our efforts. Our third priority that I want to talk to you about is fostering an agile culture, which means being collaborative, continuously thriving to improve, knowing it's safe to try new things and fail. The reason we're so committed to this is we want our graduates to be change makers and understand they can be more entrepreneurial, more innovative, and they can make an, addition, an incredible difference in society. These are ambitious goals, no doubt, and we're prepared to implement them all with meaningful in action. And it requires action to make this change come into effect. On the innovation and collaboration front, I wanna share a message of thanks from all of us at Georgian for the exceptional support Gray County provides our college and our students. Without you, we couldn't do it. Your confidence and investment has, in Georgian has fueled great innovation and growth. The $2 million investment you made in 2014 to support Algoma Central Corporate Marine Emergency Duty Center, well, wow, that's a mouthful. Um, but that's it, Center has yielded an incredible return on investment and impact for our students, the industry, and others across the region. It's an anchor, and I don't mean that as a pun. It actually has helped us sustain the campus. In any 12-month period, we engage anywhere between 25 and 2,800 participants in training in that center, and this was no exception during the pandemic. 
sec subject to the fourth wave of COVID disrupting our business, and let's all touch wood that it doesn't, we might well exceed the 2,800 participants by the end of March. It'd be our largest year and the growth only continues because of the quality of facilities that we have right here uh, in our community. And the county helped us make that possible. We pride ourselves on continuing to listen to the, our employers and our local communities. And we know we need to continue to change. We need you to give us feedback and we want you to know that we're always able to launch new programs and fill evolving gaps as they come forward. Let's just take, it, for example, nursing. You were a huge part in helping us advocate for nursing. We know that in 2019, healthcare partners in Gray, Bruce and Simcoe counties provided resource projections that it estimated a need to hire, hire 4,300 new nurses over the next decade. That's not 400 new nurses, that's 4,300 new nurses. This was before COVID hit. And we all understand the impact that has made both on our nurses that are doing heroic jobs, but on the communities around us. When the pandemic ends, the nursing shortage will not. As a college community, we need to be part of the solution and Georgian can meet this challenge. And thanks to you, you were able to help all colleges in Ontario get the right to have degree completion of nurses and we're still waiting for government final approval, uh, but we do know that uh, it's coming shortly, hopefully within the next three or four weeks. Uh, we've, we've made our way through all the hurdles that are required, and we know that in 2022, we will be launching our nursing degree right in Owen Sound and in Barrie. The Georgian BSCN program will help local healthcare institutions fill severe nursing shortage with highly skilled grads who have the ability to stay in their own communities, study here, make their homes here, and stay here so they can contribute to the health and well being of our community. This is about the future. This is about our shared vision. And again, I want to thank you for your leadership in helping the government allow colleges to uh, provide degrees in nursing. Our program, since the announcement was made uh, just 18 months ago in your community, uh, has been designed to meet the community needs. It will meet things like gerontology, Indigenous and mental health needs that are relevant in a rural community and will allow us to uh, make sure that our graduates understand the nursing that's required. We had an opportunity to provide our vision in more detail to the Healthcare Funding Task Force on September 14th. And I know that you've had an opportunity to have a report from them. This transition will be certainly transformative for our Owen Sound campus and the ability to deliver state-of-art training through a facility to underpin Central Ontario's first year standalone nursing degree will be huge for Georgian. As you've probably read in the minutes from the Healthcare Funding Task Force meeting, we've carved out 9,200 square feet of space to create a purpose-designed nursing and wellness wing and equip it with the latest simulation technology and artificial intelligence capabilities and healthcare equipment needed to educate BSC and students plus others and provide real life learning training experiences. And because we're beginning from the ground floor, this truly will be a state of the art facility. The transformation will be approximately 7.9, I'm sorry, 7.1 million. And the benefits of such an incredible learning space will be extended way before beyond just the nursing program to high demand occupations like our personal support worker, practical nursing, developmental service worker, and policing. These students at the Owen Sound campus will also learn and train in the new wing, and they will have the skills to work closely with our nursing graduates. 
As part of our expansion in Owen Sound, Georgian is making a significant institutional investment and also seeking support of the community. As some of council heard from my colleagues who presented to the healthcare funding task force, this is a project that needs strong partners. Gray County and Georgian have a great history of success and innovation. With an investment of 1 million from Gray County towards the implementation of Georgian's BSCN degree and learning environment, we'll join forces in a powerful way to bring solutions to our healthcare crisis, one of the most pressing needs right now. These funds, as I said, will allow nurses to train locally, graduate here and work in our community. We have a healthcare talent crisis in front of us and this initiative represents a homegrown, grow your own solution for our community in, and our region. Just this month, we received further impactful letters from Gary Sims, the president and CEO of Gray Bruce Health Services and Nora Holder, president and CEO from Collingwood General and Marine Hospital stating the direct and positive impact Georgian's BSCN program will have as they are facing these province-wide challenges. And they're realizing that many of their nurses are ready to retire and probably will shortly after the pandemic subsides. The demand is simply greater than supply. And this is before any expansion in service is done to meet the growing populations in your communities. As Gray continues to grow in both population and economic prosperity, this innovation will ensure the region has the healthcare talent it so desperately needs. Over to you, Steve, to close this off. Thanks, Mary Lynn. Um... I can't really emphasize what an incredible opportunity it is to offer a homegrown Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the Owen Sound campus, a, a leading edge uh, university program right here in Owen Sound. Um, it has such a significant impact for local students in Gray County. And I guess my background, uh, if you know me, is a professional firm and we were heavily, we are heavily or were heavily reliant on local students. Um, they were an underpinning of the practice. Um, once we extracted them from universities, so, uh, when they went to universities south of here or north, um, we had a very talented Gray County talent pool. Um, and they chose to be here. They could have worked anywhere. They could have made it anywhere, but they chose to be here. And I, what this program does is allow students to be educated here and choose to be here. Um, the second impact is our local health care system. As Mary Lynn has pointed out, uh, we're in desperate need of nurses. Um, and, and this is going to address that. The other thing is it just has a significant impact on not only the residents of Gray County, but also the business community. Healthy health, healthy health care system is a healthy community and a healthy business community. And thank you very much. Um, so as you can see, we've, we're at a very exciting time for Georgian College, in particular the Owen Sound campus, our students in Gray County. Uh, Georgian College is very proud to be part of Gray County and very much looking forward to the, uh, launching this new degree. Uh, I think it's a game changer. And I know together we can continue to turn opportunities into long-term benefits that will serve Georgian students from Gray County well now into the future. And thank you very much, uh, County Council, for your time today. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and uh, Mary Lynn. Uh, I have to tell you, a, a four-year um, honors Bachelor of Science nursing program here locally is for me uh, very exciting. And you're quite right. Uh, Steve, it is a, a game changer. Uh, Mary Lynn, um, I like that you started off your presentation by saying, I'm here to provide you with an update on your college. Uh, you're right, it is our college. And I like that you, you mentioned it that way. It is an update on our college. This has been uh, quite the partnership. We've been your partners all the way and we've enjoyed success together and, uh, and moving forward. 
I know that we'll continue to work together uh, to have even further uh, successes. Uh, could I have the full screen, please, so I could see uh, the hands? Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Potter, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, more of a comment than a question, but uh, here in the Blue Mountains, we feel doubly blessed because we have the South Southern Georgia Bay Campus just a short distance away, as well as the Old Sound Campus. Um, but to build on the, some of the comments that were made when we did our economic development strategy, which I led about 12 years ago here in the Blue Mountains, one of the things we heard about over and over and over again was the need for more post-secondary education uh, facilities within our area to help drive economic uh, benefits for the area. And uh, I know that the delegation or the deputation touched on that. Uh, I just wanted to underline it, that, that that is so important. And the more we can work in partnership with Georgian and I will say other facilities, not to, uh, not to invite competition, but certainly uh, there are others that, that have sp other specialties. Uh, I think they can, uh, they, they add to the richness of life in our communities, but they also add to our, ec to our economic activity. And uh, it's, it's uh, the, there, are, there are some other possibilities. I remember talking about a school of geriatric medicine being a natural for our area. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'm going to push you, uh, but but yeah, the the future is full of possibilities for Georgia and for us, and I think that uh, we all need to continue our partnership and and have this uh, going uh, even more uh, more full tilt to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Potter. I don't see any other. Oh, oh, oh Councillor Compass, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and good morning, uh, County Council, and good morning to you, Mary Lynn, nice to see you again, and to you, Mr. Lowe. Thanks so much for this very, very exciting uh, presentation. It's the second time I've heard it now, and it gets more exciting every time we hear it. So couldn't be more enthusiastic about uh, the project ahead of us and the partnership that, uh, that we're all looking at, uh, at forming here. Um, access to uh, primary health care is very near and dear to my heart and, and, and recognizing uh, the deficiencies that we have in this area in some cases. And I think that this program is just going to be wonderful in terms of addressing the needs in, in that direction. So thank you so much for that. We're, uh, um, I'm just so thrilled to, to see it happening. And I'm wondering, uh, from the perspective of uh, local participation in perhaps uh, providing some um, scholarships or some incentives for our students, uh, some uh, encouragement through our high school programming and all of those kinds of things that we can do at the municipal level. Um, can you give us some kind of an idea of a cost for a four-year program? for um, students entering into this very exciting opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, I, I, I have to be careful because, you know, when people ask me numbers and I know we're going live on, on this, but it is a degree program mm -hmm. and the tuition is more like uh, four or $5,000 a semester, Barb, so it's an expensive, program for students to be in. We do run extensive scholarship programs. We do run bursaries. Uh, of course, our first goal is to get the capital to get the facility there, but we would be eager to talk to anyone who wanted to support a student. We run a number of scholarship and bursary uh, programs. Um, in particular, there's a neat program that we run called Women in Tuition, um, and it is tuition support uh, from women and men who want to give women a leg up in higher education. And I believe education is the greatest equalizer in life. And um, both if you can give a student an opportunity to get an education, I know that money comes back to us so many different ways in our, in our community. So there are our scholarships, we will have bursaries. Um, and uh, you know we will work hard to make sure that students can't 
who can't afford to come to higher education have the ability to do that. And, and we have an extensive support financial aid system, Barb, that supports that. Uh, you know, we're very, very mindful that a large portion of our students are also eligible for Ontario tuition support, and we work very closely with them for that. So no student should be turned away from a higher education institution, and we work hard to make sure that it's affordable for them. And we look forward to the community helping us in, in nursing as we move this forward. And if I could, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I just I just want to do uh, make one reference about the uh, South Georgian Bay campus, if I could. Um, because um, as you will know, um, a couple of years ago, the focus was on the shortage in the hospitality industry. And we had great success in um, launching a number of international hospitality programs. And they unfortunately, you know, have been put on hold because it's hard for international students to get in the country. But I can tell you yesterday, India and Canada came to an agreement that flights from India can start again, and we're starting to see more flights. So, you know, for those of you who are thinking about the hospitality industry, um, certainly we'll be resuming those programs as soon as we absolutely can. So great, great point, Rob, about making sure both uh, campuses are sustainable. But we want to also design it in a way that the programs that we offer are distinct enough that we have enough students at each campus to sustain it and grow and support both the communities um, that kind of are twinned in your catchment area. Thank you very much. I do not see any other hands. So with that said, I'm going to thank <clears throat> you, Steve and Mary Lynn for a very exciting uh, uh, presentation. Very well done, and we're all looking forward to seeing this thing uh, move forward. Thank you again. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Okay, next Thank on you. the Thank agenda. You. Sorry, did I miss something? No, I think we're just we were uh, thanking, Thank thanking you. your time. <laughs> all right, cheers. Bye now. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, we do. Mr. Have Warden? Yes. I apologize. I do see Councillor Robinson oh, with her my hand apologies. up. Apologies, Councillor Robinson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and thank you, uh, Clerk. I just want to advise uh, Council that I will be asking for a reconsideration of one of the consent items, number C, PDR CW 2021, Chapman's Official Plan Amendment, number 10, Merit uh, Report, and uh, would ask for that be addressed at the appropriate time so that uh, we could have a discussion in terms of having that um, resolution uh, addressed uh, differently. So if you could assist in terms of when that reconsideration and uh, consideration for a different course of action could take place. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. I'm in your hands because we have approved the consent uh, agenda already. Um, we will look at this at the end of the items for discussion and we'll look for a resolution um, to uh, review that uh, particular um, item on the consent agenda. I'll Thank put you. some working together during that time. Thank you. That is six what? Six, um, six C. Six C, yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Fair enough, Councillor Robinson? Yes, thank you very much. Look okay. forward to that discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so we are on to our uh, next uh, delegation. Let me get back up here. Uh, and I did see Monsieur, I want to say Monsieur, anytime I see the name Stefan Tremblay, I feel like I should say Monsieur. Uh, he is uh, with the uh, Bogner Bridges and Roads Committee uh, um, of Ratepayers. Uh, you're next and you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Morning. Um, Esteemed councillors, a member of councils and your worship, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to present to you today on, on this issue. Uh, that is um, very important to us. Um, we have a presentation, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, so I would like to orient you to the ground um, so that you have an idea of uh, what uh, we're dealing with here. Are you able to see the map? Not yet. Not yet, all right. There you go. 
Are you able to see this? I am, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, so the first map I would like to, um, uh, to introduce you to um, is a map of the farms that surrounds the two bridges that are closed, who used to use those bridges up until they were closed. So our presentation, of course, is about bridge 2122, uh, which is on the town line between Meaford and Chatsworth. Uh, the bridge has been closed since 20, January 2016. Um, so the map, north is the top of the map, south is uh, the bottom, of course, and, and west and east. And you can see uh, there's a distribution of about 16 farming operations around, which in total cover 7,200 acres um, of uh, valley farmland um, between Walters Falls, surrounding Walters Falls and Wagner. Uh, what you see here, the little dots in green, and in uh, yellow are the bridges that are um, giving us access to that land. And the bridge 2122 is the red dot right here in the center of the map. So I would like to switch my screen now to, um, to the presentation deck, which I believe you have a copy of. So if you give me just a minute, I will share my screen again with the presentation. Uh, do you see the, um, the slide called map, slide number two of the deck? Yes, I do. Excellent. Thank you. So just to do a bit of an introduction uh, of Brad and I. Um, so I am the, the chairman of the uh, Wagner um, Road and uh, Bridge and Roads Committee. It's a committee of ratepayers that was formed following the closure of the bridge uh, to give a voice to uh, the people who use that bridge and were denied the usage of that bridge by virtue of, its, of their closures. Um, we have been in this um, uh, area uh, since 2011. Uh, we've been farming since uh, 1647 in Canada. Um, that is the Trombley families. And we're uh, happy to have uh, moved here and contribute uh, in terms of investment and effort in um, reopening lands in the Gray Islands here near Walters Falls. I'm joined with our vice chair um, of the committee, uh, Brad Torrey, whose family uh, came here in 1890 and they're in their fifth generation of farming um, the land that they currently have um, in the area. Uh, so the second map that I would like to show you before I pass the, the floor to Brad um, is the map of uh, the geographical area um, around surrounding the two bridges. So what you see here where you have X's are all of the steep hills uh, that are grades anywhere from seven to 11%. Uh, um, for those of you who are engineer minded, uh, they are fairly steep hill to negotiate uh, with any kind of trailer or loads. Uh, as you can see, uh, the general contour line of the valley are such that this is the high point and this is the low point of the valley. And then this is the plateau um, that surrounds the Grey Highlands. Um, the lines, the white, blue and yellow line um, outlines these soft grade approach roads that the farmers uh, use to bring their grains back to their farms or to bring grains to elevators that are on the seventh line. Uh, so you will see here that there's a, um, a low soft grade approach going through Walters Falls uh, with uh, highway, uh, County Road 40, um, Side Road 4 and Deviation Line and the Town Line is another soft grade road that is heavily used by agricultural traffic and the blue line um, between the two steep hills here is also a, a soft grade approach. So. What that means is any kind of ag services trucks would use those roads, such as milk trucks or feed trucks, and the farmers uh, towing um, wagons with hay or grain would use those trucks to avoid the steep hills. Um, so you've now been oriented to the ground. I would like to leave the floor for uh, the next part of our presentation to Brad um, uh, to facilitate that that presentation. Brad. Brad, before you get started, I'll give you a second. I apologize that I did not include you in the uh, introduction. Okay, well, that, that's okay. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, sir. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, hearing some of our thoughts this morning. And I said to Stefan uh, a couple days ago, the way, with the way the weather was, we were off to an early harvest. I said, this could be a real conflict for me this morning. But 
six inches of rain later, it's turned out to be a good morning. So anyway, just a few things I want us to ponder before I uh, share a few thoughts um, that we can just get in our heads is that agriculture still is the number one economic driver for the county and also most of our municipalities. And we are currently experiencing a new wave of investment in our, in our rural gray, new building, farm clearing, tile draining, um, and just like your houses in town, land values over even the last two years have really accelerated. So we need our county municipalities to keep up with the infrastructure and to operate these operations safely and efficient, efficiently, including the bridges. And I think sometimes when you're out here in the back roads, you, you tend to feel like you're forgotten. So like I said, my name is Brad Torrey. I'm speaking on behalf of the farmers and agribusiness that use the twin bridges. The push to have them reopened has been a slow, painful process with hundreds of hours invested in presentations, meeting and talking with our local politicians. It first started with the ownership was me for its responsibility to three years later that Chatsworth was half owner under a new boundary agreement to now that the county may be responsible for one of the structures due to the length of the span. This closure to the East Corridor has been a huge blow for the farm community, agribusiness, local residents, and the increasing number of homes and tourists to the area. All business are built on safety, then efficiencies, which both of these have been overlooked. The alternate routes are, are now a liability for a growing ag community. The hauling of grains, feedstuffs, livestock, and heavy truck deliveries has become an art most days to negotiate the steep grades all four seasons of the year, not to mention the thousands of dollars it's costing in extra transportation each year. Infrastructure is huge for farmers to have good roads and bridges to do our job safely and efficiently. By doing nothing, it sends a loud message that we don't really matter and are putting a price on safety. If you support agriculture, now is the time to show your leadership and I put the challenge out that um, the alternate routes, um, unless you physically come and uh, drive these roads or want to join in someday with a couple big loads of hay or a manure spreader, uh, you really don't get the, um, the struggles where we deal with daily. So um, anyway, keep those things in mind and I appreciate your time and I'm going to pass it back to Steph. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. So to add to uh, Brad's uh, presentation, um, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, uh, a couple of, uh, an, a number of usage facts. Um, so as Brad mentioned, the, the agriculture sector in Gray County is still um, one of the largest uh, income and wealth generator. Um, in the valley um, surrounding, surrounded by Walters Falls and Bogner, Bogner we have 29 farming operations. Um, we have five local businesses that use this infrastructure. Um, and I refer to all the infrastructure within um, that area. There's nine tourist attractions and, and, it, and it is growing. Um, there's also a growth in resident as we can uh, know, witness uh, by the new houses going up around us in the new farm buildings. And uh, there's certainly, uh, an increase in traffic of all kinds, including tourism. Um, we also note that uh, there is a duty, there is a duty existing under the Ontario Regulation 104 and Section 973 uh, for the municipalities to maintain the infrastructure they inherited during the, uh, uh, the down, the down uh, loading of that infrastructure to the municipalities that uh, we feel may not have been uh, diligently uh, kept uh, over the past decades. Uh, the pictures you see there are recent events to illustrate what uh, the challenge we, we face. Um, and I uh, will apologize that we didn't have the video ready of uh, the drone to show you the extent of uh, the hills that are on the proposed alternate roads uh, that justifies partially the closure of the two, the two bridges. Uh, again, I'd like to invite all of you, if you have a chance to drive around and come and see what we have to deal with. And um, if you're interested, we'll gladly have you in the tractor with us when we're trying to negotiate those hill downward with 40 tons of hay or grain in the back of the tractor. 
uh, you'll see, you'll realize very quickly that, that it, 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 the alternative roads are not safe uh, for our operators and ourselves. The, and at the core of the safety issue here also is the fact that um, the valley is the furthest away from fire ambulance and police service. We happen to be right in the middle of, of the furthest distance from Meaford, from Intertownship, and from Chatsworth, uh, police fire and ambulance service. Um, and in February of 2020, uh, we had two kids who were sent to hospital because of a bus that took the side road 10 um, hill, uh, and it's a blind hill, hit a grader that was uh, doing its work in the winter. And that bus route was rerouted as a result of 2122 being uh, shut down. It usually it used to use the, uh, the two bridges, uh, and that accident would have been avoided if the bridges had been kept open. Um, an important fact as well for you to keep in mind is the fact is, is the, um, the fact that we, as, as local users of the bridges, we send an average 1.1 million per year in property taxes, and this ex include, excludes the education levies uh, to both municipalities and to the county. Um, in terms of economic activities sustained in, in this valley, um, in, which those two bridges are core, uh, to is uh, it's about sixteen and a half million dollars to our estimate last year. Um, about nine point six million of income is generated by the uh, the farms that farms the seven thousand two hundred acres surrounded uh, surrounding those two bridges. The agribiz sector, which serves those farms, generates about three point nine million dollars of revenue, and the um, other sectors businesses that operates and that used to use those bridges generate about two point three million dollars a year. And uh, other incomes that are not uh, business related is about $592,000. So by our estimate based on OMAFRA and AgriCorp and StatScan and Industry Canada's data, um, we, have, we generate about $6.5 million of income uh, in this area, uh, in the area surrounding the bridges. And I should mention that the agricultural revenue does not include the quota income. So if any of those farms have a chicken or a milk uh, quota, that's not included in this number. As far as the individual impact um, that the closure of the bridge has had in the past five years, uh, this table will, will show you uh, that every individual who used to drive over those two bridges have now had to use detours. And those detours essentially, um, if, you're, if you're traveling to the west or you're traveling to the east, added a, an average, um, if you're using alternate, alternate route A or B, uh, which are the, the alternate routes around the bridges, will either add 12 kilometers or 23 kilometers to your trip. At 56 cents a kilometer, um, an average of seven to $13 going west uh, per trip. Uh, and the number of trips per year is estimated at about 576 and with, a, with a, uh, a time here associated with it. It costs every individual who has been inconvenienced by the closure of those two bridges an additional about $3,700 to $7,000, depending on which road you take. And you still expose yourself to added safety um, uh, risks by using steeper hills. Uh, and the same thing with going east. Uh, so on average, um, we've added 14 kilometers to the trips of the residents and, and business owners and business operators, about um, a 20 minutes ride, and also about an extra $4,000 to our cost. And that's been sustained since the bridge have been closed by the individuals have been inconvenienced. Why these bridges are important beside the safety aspects, um, they support our farmer as, as uh, Brad's mentioned, and also they cannot be um, taken outside of the, of the context of the topography. Uh, we live in the Grey Highlands. Uh, we are challenged by hills and valleys and gullies um, to cross. And we have to have safe access to our farms and our fields uh, to be able to continue contributing to the county and the municipality, the municipal success and wealth. Um, it, it, it has increased our costs and it, it also has reduced our access to police, fire and ambulance service. Um, and to, to a very large degree, 
it, it creates the impression that we are now a second class of ratepayers who receive less services from the municipalities and county despite paying over $1.1 million in property taxes per year. Um, we need these bridges reopen going forward. Uh, we have been um, trying to make our voice heard for the past four or five years, uh, not too much success. And we are getting now to a point where um, we may very well be in danger or if they've been closed for five years, they, they don't need them. Uh, and I think Pat can attest to the fact that the interest is still very much alive in these bridges, when he came to measure them, there were over 30 people who attended the bridge measurement by his own word. They were the, it was the largest crowd uh, witnessing the measurement of a bridge uh, since he, he started with the county. Uh, so we cannot help but to feel uh, that although we duty pay our taxes, we, we, have, we do not enjoy the same opportunity to feel safe on our roads to prosper without undue losses and to be happy as other ratepayers are in the county. And we feel let down, honestly, by our politicians and civil servants who were hired to mine the infrastructure they inherited 25 years ago uh, from our fathers and mothers. So we would very much like to see a commitment um, going forward and a shared vision and a plan for the growth of the development of the valley, which would include uh, the support to the agricultural sector, which provide a large income to individuals who work in it uh, and provides benefit back in terms of tourism and investment. Um, we do need all partners to, to work together, which has not necessarily been the case so far. And we see a, a genuine, unique opportunity for county to take the lead on this um, and bring the federal, the province and the two municipalities together uh, and try to apply innovation uh, instead of bureaucratic thinking and trying to solve this problem that been, that's been created for us uh, for the past five years. Um, it, we would very much like to see also a commitment to continue investing in the infrastructure to support uh, the vision and the potential that the Valley has to offer for the county, both on the tourism aspect, but also in the, in the business and agricultural aspect. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. We're Tony. left with the following question, uh, Your Worship, yeah, as far Sorry. as, as uh, the future of this infrastructure and, and, and the directions that our governments, various level of governments will take. And um, we're, we'd like very much to leave you with, with uh, this to ponder is, will council show its support uh, for one of its largest revenue generators and accept the responsibility for the larger of the two bridges? Uh, and will council also actively work with both municipalities and the two other level of governments to, to get involved in uh, getting us out of the impasse that we're in um, and, and get those bridge reopened and fixed, preferably before the next election? Um, and will council please um, give us a clear statement as to what it intends to do to support the growth of our community going forward, because we are left in a bit of a cloud of doubt as to whether or not we matter in this area. Um, and in closing, if, if I'm allowed, um, this issue is not about a half inch in length of a bridge closed for nearly five years. It is really about correcting a gross negligence of a legal responsibility on the law um, by the parties involved. It is, as Brad mentioned, showing leadership where the jurisdictions involved are hoping that this issue will go away. Um, it is also encouraging innovation instead of bureaucratic thinking and finding a solution. There are plenty of solutions that will not cost $2 million per bridge um, that we are quite amenable to look at um, if we're given a chance. And it's also about investing in the future of our growing community and, 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 and in one of the county's assets. In whichever way this council decide on this issue, um, I'd like to remind you that it will continue to have a material impact on our safety on our faith in our institution, in, in our, on, on our prosperity, and also in our continued investment in this valley. Uh, I remind you that just in the past uh, 10 years, $71 million of our uh, individual monies uh, have gone into rebuilding our farms, improving them, draining the fields, and so on and so forth. That is not a small investment. And if you'd like us to continue doing this, I mean, we need to have some kind of assurance from the county that this investment is not wasted. So we kindly request that county, council consider seriously taking ownership of one of the bridges and that it takes the leadership role in reopening both of them. 
we'd like to thank you for your attention and time. And I would like to thank Brad as well for his, uh, his presentation this morning as for his time. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Mr. Tremblay. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tory. Uh, Councillor O'Leary has a question for you. Thank yes. you, Mr. Gordon, and good morning, County Council. Uh, Stephan and Brad, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I, I've looked over your usage facts, your economic activity. Um, I've studied your individual impact. I, I can't help but look at our $8 million 10th Street Bridge that we just replaced that has 30,000 cars a day going over it, sometimes 50,000 in the tourist season. And we received zero dollars from the County of Gray. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Explain to me the difference between this $8 million bridge and getting no money from the County and your bridge. Why would we put money into your bridge when it's not a County road? I can certainly understand um, the question, Councillor O'Leary, and, and thank you for, uh, for raising it. Um, of course, the, the conundrum that we run into when we have a rural and an urban uh, county is how much of the resources do we have will we invest um, in the, inf the, the given infrastructure of each of the constituent part of the county. And in Owen Sound and Hanover, of course, you're incorporated cities and we unfortunately have to work within the confine of the municipal act. Um, which impose um, responsibilities on each of the various um, constituent governments to look after the infrastructure that they've been given. And I use the 10th Street Bridge um, almost every week, uh, four or five times. And I understand that it's sustained the traffic uh, that moves not only county traffic, city traffic, but also uh, provincial traffic on its way to Tobermory. And uh, I cannot answer why you failed to re receive funding from the federal or the province on that, on that particular piece of infrastructure. Um, but to answer your question as to why counties should consider investing uh, in this bridge, I understand that county has given itself some rules with regards to town line bridges, uh, where they may be uh, two different ability to pace between municipalities and that that bridge may very well be falling under um, that, uh, that rule that county gets involved in helping uh, the two municipalities resolve their um, inabilities or inabilities to pay or discrepancy in ability to pay for this piece of infrastructure. Um, but also to keep in mind that the county should consider investing in those bridges because 46% of its population still is living in a rural area. And the tax wealth that is generated by the county comes from one of its largest sector, the agricultural sector, uh, which is predominantly in and outside the uh, urban areas of the county. Um, and from that regard, the municipalities have a lower tax base to draw from to be able to um, pay for that infrastructure. And, and that is why the higher level governments um, should be solicited in terms of trying to find a solution and fund the solution. Um, here, there is no doubt that if I were an Owen Sound counselor, I'd be wondering, well, why, why should I pay $2 million for uh, 2,900 residents uh, as opposed to 50,000 people who use my bridge in my town? Um, to be honest with you, there's no real answer to that in the end. And I guess when it comes to governance, the question of equitable distribution of the, com uh, the communal wealth um, is, less, is left for you as councillors to decide where you're going to get your best bang for the buck. Uh, there's no doubt that the, side, the, the Tent Road street, street Bridge or the Tent Street Bridge support a lot of economic activity. Uh, and I can't speak to, the, to why the county has not funded uh, that bridge per se. But what we're asking is that is we should ri raise, rise about, above our differences and our, our petty esprit de cloche, as we say in Quebec, uh, to try to resolve a problem uh, for 
a significant part of our community and uh, of our two municipalities. And it very much depends on the vision whether or not we want to be insular and 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 infighting, or we want we want whether we, we want to demonstrate uh, communal support uh, for the better welfare of and the increased welfare and wealth of all of our 93,000 residents in the county, as opposed to just 22,000. Uh, we're not going to resolve I, I this. Don't wanna, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, Mr. Tremble, yeah. but uh, I do see a number of uh, hands, and so I want to mm -hmm. make sure yeah. everybody has a chance to ask uh, questions. Councillor O'Leary, is there anything else from you? Yeah, just to follow up comment. Um, it, it's, uh, Stephen, your answer is exactly what I thought. There is no real answer. And, yeah. And it's not that that I'm not sympathetic to your to your problem. My point is, it's it's just not um, county's responsibility to put money into bridges or, or this particular bridge any more than the county didn't put money into our bridge. It's it's just you know we have to look at the county as a whole, uh, not just as individuals. I'm only giving you the 10th Street Bridge as an example, mm -hmm. but uh, you know I, I just don't see the issue with um, I, it's just not a county. Uh, responsibility. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Keegany, you're next. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Tromley and Mr. Tory for presenting to us this morning, and uh, I know you both know that you have and have had my support in this issue for, uh, for a number of years, and I very much appreciate the uh, safety concerns that you have brought to our attention and the importance of agriculture across uh, the county. And, uh, and especially in your own leadership with the Bogner Bridges and Roads Committee. It's, it's uh, uh, the only committee that I'm aware of within the county where a group of, of farmers have come together to uh, advocate for their needs. And I think that's just uh, incredibly important. And I know we'll talk more when we get into the presentation of the report about uh, um, the responsibility of the county, but my understanding is that it just comes down to the measurement at which I was present and it does uh, meet the requirements and we'll hear from Randy and uh, Pat and so on when we get into that discussion. But my question for both of you, if I may, is I wonder if you could expand a little bit from your perspective on uh, the type of crossing, the uh, kind of bridge that you'd like to see should uh, the county and municipalities go forward with the with this investment. Um, do you require a, a, a double lane bridge or does a single lane bridge work and, and what um, just from that uh, from that perspective, if you could share a little bit about what uh, what kind of crossing would really meet your needs as, as we go forward with the discussion. Well, we we remain cognizant of the fact uh, that this is not going to be a, a county road, and it's not going to be sustaining fifty thousand crossing a day. Um, so, really, what we're looking for is, is a structure sufficient uh, for for our uh, operators to be able to drive a tractor and a couple of uh, wagon either lo loaded with hay or loaded with, uh, with grain and sufficient enough to sustain the weight of a combine, um, which is the type of agricultural traffic that most um, would be mostly using those bridges. Uh, so a single lane a bridge that is wide enough uh, to accommodate uh, those equipment um, and to accommodate the pedestrian traffic uh, that is um, negotiating the bridge when they're using the Bruce Trail um, would be more than sufficient for us. Anything else, Councillor Keegan? Um, not at this time, Mr. Ward, and thank you, Mr. Trombley, for your response. Uh, Councillor Desai, you're next. Thank you, Ward. Next, um, <clears throat> I, as, um, I, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tory and Mr. Trombley, for the presentation. Uh, I, I will take this opportunity to uh, to say that this really highlights the importance of good asset management. Um, uh, the, the other the other uh, question I have, Warden Hicks, is this is perhaps for staff. Um, uh, the gentleman mentioned that uh, um, the director for transportation was out uh, measuring bridges and, and looking at it. Um, my question is: Is there a staff report as forthcoming? Um, or what's the, what's the follow-up from that? Um, and then finally, uh, Councillor O'Leary, I think he, uh, he maybe saved himself with, the, with his last statement, but I was about to say he, he ought to remember he's representing Gray County and not Owen Sound uh, at this table. 
but I, I do appreciate the presentation and, and I just, uh, I think it's, it's a great reminder of how important good asset management is. Thank you, Warden Next. Thank you, Councillor Desai. And I believe that the answer to your question, uh, we're gonna be discussing this matter uh, next with the report that's uh, coming up in item 7.1. Um, so I, I believe that, that question will get answered. If I'm wrong about that, then maybe staff can correct me. But I want to make sure that we save that discussion for when we're discussing the report that's before us. Yeah, that's correct, uh, Mr. Warden. It'll be uh, addressed as part of the, the staff report that's uh, later on the agenda. Very good. And uh, I noticed that the recommendation in there is that uh, staff would bring back uh, a report for review, but we'll have that discussion uh, shortly. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, fairly familiar with that area because that is sort of the way I go up to county council. Um, when I when we were going to county council, that was my uh, route that I would travel. So I am familiar with that area. Just as a side, I know like all all of our municipalities are are. I don't know if the word is blessed or however, but there are, each municipality um, do have uh, a large number of uh, water crossing bridges. Uh, I guess it makes up the beauty of Gray, Gray County as it is. And uh, certainly from uh, Gray Highlands perspective, we've done asset or not an asset, but a, a road bridge study. And we have classified a lot of our bridges from high, medium and low priority and have been continuing to upgrade those bridges and we have had struggled, we have struggled over low low volume roads, but we've continued to maintain or come up with solutions for those uh, water crossings. As one example, and maybe we can think of, uh, maybe there's possibilities of thinking outside the box. I know we had a particular uh, uh, water crossing bridge that was very much deteriorated to the point where we were being faced to close the road, but we looked at other solutions and what we ended up coming with, coming up with was uh, two large culverts that we installed, or actually um, our staff installed. They removed the, the old bridge. It was a lower valley road just off of County Road 7 and certainly installed two large um, culverts that we certainly were, were engineered to, the, to, to be sufficient for, I guess, those 100-year storms. However, you have to make sure you, may, you, you engineer it for. But basically, with our staff doing that, with material that we provide, it costs us about $40,000 compared to a high cost that we were looking at through replacing it as, a, as an engineered, um, an engineered uh, concrete um, structure. So, again, I just wondered if there are ways of looking outside the box in the sense of looking at new solutions. And if you wanted to follow up with our staff on what we did there, it certainly was a very cost effective way because there was a lot of agricultural uses on that road, a very low volume road. But uh, again, we felt it was important to maintain that access. So anyway, I just, I just convey that. And uh, again, we, uh, Mr. Warden, we'll, we'll further have a conversation on the report that's coming up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh... I just uh, I want to thank the two gentlemen for their presentation and being involved with agriculture myself, I can fully appreciate the uh, challenges of trying to uh, move product and equipment on the roads. Um, I mean, the traffic itself is just nuts these days without having to worry about steep hills and all the rest of it. So I, I can fully uh, empathize with the uh, situation the uh, producers in that area encounter. Uh, I was just going to say, and I'm, perhaps I, we'll get into it during the, the staff report later in the meeting, but there is a uh, structure up in that part of the world that the county installed a number of years ago uh, under our previous uh, director of transportation that cost the county a significant amount of money and a lot of engineering and a lot of uh, uh, heart-stopping uh, debate, I'm sure. Uh, so to suggest that the county shouldn't participate, uh, I think is, uh, is uh, wrong. I, I believe the county should participate if it's a matter of inches, uh, length matters, I guess, is what someone might say. But uh, I, I look forward to the discussion during the debate 
uh, during the uh, staff report rather. And uh, I think uh, I think maybe we uh, all need to uh, to consider Mr. or Councillor Desai's uh, comments earlier. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that's just probably a good uh, point to segue uh, to item 7.1. Uh, Mr. Tremblay and uh, Mr. Tory, I want to thank you very much uh, for your delegation today. And I would ask you to stick around because we're going to discuss this very item uh, through the staff report that's coming up next. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we are now going to turn to item uh, 7A. Um, I think that puts uh, Randy on deck uh, discussing uh, structures 21 and 22. This item has been moved by Councillor Mill and seconded by Councillor Burley. Randy, you have the floor. Great, thank you, and and good morning, everyone. Um, I know Pat is tied up in other meetings. Uh, I think he's connected in right now, um, so he's hopping in between meetings. So I'm going to do my best to present an overview of this report, um, and if Pat is connected in, he can uh, help answer any questions that. Uh, committee members may have. Uh, first, I just wanna thank Stefan and Brad for their presentation this morning and, and highlighting the concerns and challenges as a result of these structures being closed. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, you pro providing that presentation for sure. Um, so the, the, this report, we staff wanted to provide council with some background information regarding these structures based on what we currently know and to seek direction from council on whether you would like staff to investigate some additional matters identified in the staff report. Uh, recently, Gray County uh, has been contacted by Ms. Pai Meaford to investigate whether Structure 22 should be a Gray County asset. Um, Structure 21, which is just situated to the west, as, as highlighted in the uh, uh, delegation presentation today, um, it is a, has a span of 5.1 meters, which is under the span length to be considered a county structure. Um, so that's that's the structure that's just immediately to the west of structure 22. A Meaford staff report uh, was presented to Meaford Council in June uh, of this year, uh, which suggested that Meaford and Chatsworth um, uh, would follow the county's lead regarding any decisions on either the replacement of the continued closure of the structures, depending on the outcome of structure 22. Uh, in terms of uh, ownership. Um, as, as highlighted earlier, typically the county owns bridges on a town line road where the span of the bridge is greater than 20 feet, which is approximately 6.096 meters. Uh, this length was established through a bylaw, uh, in fact, a bylaw 1102 that was passed in 1928. Uh, structure 22 is currently not in the Gray County structure inventory. Uh, the span of the structure 22 is still somewhat in question. The OSIM report that has been completed by Meaford in the past states that the span is 6.3 meters. Gray County staff performed a measurement last month uh, with one side measuring at 6.085 meters and the other side being 6.094 meters, which is just slightly under the 6.096 meter span. Uh, subsequently, this structure was also measured by Meaford's bridge consultant uh, recently and found to be 6.10 uh, meters, uh, and in their opinion, satisfies their criteria to be considered a county structure. There are other historical facts uh, about the structure that are unknown to county staff at this time uh, in order to truly determine um, ownership, and these could be investigated further if council uh, so directs. Uh, this includes things like who originally constructed Structure 22, who has been maintaining or contributing to the maintenance of the structure since the time it was originally constructed. Meaford did complete an environmental assessment in 2017 on the structures, which recommended that the structures be removed, uh, and a link to the EA document was included in the report. If a different option were to be considered beyond what was recommended in the 2017 EA, then the environmental assessment would need to be reopened uh, to potentially arrive at another result. Um, and it's our understanding that Meaford Council would carry money uh, in their budget to potentially reopen the uh, environmental assessment. Uh, Meaford has also completed a preliminary design report evaluating different construction options for the two structures. 
uh, with prices ranging anywhere from 750000 to over $4 million. And that's for both structures. If Gray County owns structure 22, uh, the recommendation may be to remove the structure due to liability issues, which is the current recommendation in the environmental assessment completed by Meaford. As Council heard today, uh, local citizens, uh, farming operations and other local businesses have expressed the importance of the structures and the corresponding road for, for their operations. Uh, there are also many trails in the immediate area and the bridges uh, provide linkages to some of those potential trail loops. We did highlight in the staff report that as part of the 2015 transportation master plan that was received by council, that one of the action items that was uh, supported by council was to develop bridge classification criteria based on principles of when a bridge should be replaced or closed and to evaluate options to transfer county owned structures on local municipal roads. So those structures that have already been identified on local municipal roads, looking at potential options to, to transfer these. Um, the bridge classification criteria has not been completed to date, and therefore the evaluation of options to transfer uh, those county owned structures on local roads has not been explored at this time. However, staff wanted to highlight this previous direction from Council regarding structures as it, on local municipal roads. In order for Council to uh, make a, a dis, an informed decision uh, with respect to um, this particular matter, uh, there are some other things that uh, would potentially need to be investigated should council direct staff to explore this topic uh, further. These include, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the history of the structure, including when it was built, who built the structure, who paid for the original construction and ongoing maintenance of these structures. Um, and uh, if, if directed, Transportation Services would work with Grey Roots uh, archive staff uh, to search for any potential historical records uh, in that regard. Uh, other areas that we would need to investigate are what are the liabilities and risks associated with the structure in its current state. Uh, we would also want to confirm the costs uh, to replace Structure 22 as part of already the discussion and questions there may be a, a multitude of different options uh, to consider. Uh, so that's something that we'd want to bring back some further information to council uh, with respect to the costs. Also confirming the plans and intentions of the municipality Meaford and the township of Chatsworth with respect to structure 21. Um, for example, if structure 22 were to be replaced, uh, would the municipality of Meaford and the township of Chatsworth commit to replacing uh, and maintaining structure 21? Um, also looking at other options, uh, is there a more cost effective solution for all parties, uh, example replacing the two structures with one and sharing the cost three ways or as Councillor McQueen indicated, uh, can these these structures be replaced uh, through uh, through a culvert versus a, a bridge structure so those are some of the things that we want to explore further. Um, and are there other options beyond uh, the uh, municipality and or the county owning these structures. Um, that could be considered. And, and we've identified some of those potential options uh, in the staff report as well. Everything from potentially leasing these road structures, uh, making this, a, a, this particular road section a, a private road, um, looking at some sort of road association uh, ownership framework uh, in order to continue to have this, uh, this, these structures and road um, open and maintained. There are other uh, legislation and legal considerations that we uh, would need to be explored uh, further as well. So based on this, uh, the recommendation is to receive this report. And if council is, is interested in investigating this topic further, to direct staff to move forward with these investigations and to bring back a staff report, which would provide further information for council to consider and would outline potential next steps and options for council's consideration. And we'd be happy to take any questions that council may have. Thank you very much. And before we go to questions, uh, Pat, is there anything that you wanted to add to this? No, I think I'll just wait and see what the questions are and we can respond to those. Excellent. Uh, Councillor Keegan, you're first. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. And I just wanted to add, if I may, Randy, a little bit of clarification to the original EA conducted by Meaford. Okay. Uh, the problem statement that was attached to that did include 
uh, reference to um, potentially closing the bridges. And uh, since then, our council in Meaford has readdressed our bridge SOTI report, State of the Infrastructure, and has determined that we wish to keep all bridges open again, recognizing the impact on the agricultural community. So with that change, yes, Meaford does have uh, funding in our reserves to do a second EA and that problem statement statement would be very different and would suggest that we look at uh, solutions for these bridges. And I, I appreciate the discussion of exploring alternate bridge construction because we know there's lots of uh, companies out there now who are creating solutions because these are not the only bridges within our county and, and well beyond where uh, we recognize that we can't make huge investments of millions of dollars, but the bridges need to be need to be kept open and how do we do that at an affordable price? So I do believe that uh, the bridge companies are, are looking at solutions and I, I would strongly encourage County Council to go forward with the recommendation of uh, staff undertaking a report so that some of those uh, potential solutions could be explored. And I just wanted to add as well, having been present at uh, the measurement exercise that uh, there was discussion that day that the bridges probably weren't designed to be six point, 08 meters or 6.094 meters and their very strong likelihood is that they were designed to be 20 feet at the time of the construction and we recognize that in, in this period of time that there's been some wear and decay on the concrete which has probably caused them to be now uh, just slightly less than that 20 feet but I would be very certain that that was uh, the original design and I see Pat even nodding so thank you for that so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to further questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor O'Leary, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Well, I find it encouraging after listening to Randy that there's there may be multiple options to look at. And I certainly look forward to seeing a report come back. Um, the big thing for me, obviously, is, um, and, and we can ask this question when the report comes back, is, is this going to be precedent setting? Um, you know, are we going to replace this bridge and then uh, all of a sudden we have 10 or 12 to replace. And, and, and so that's, that's my big concern. And uh, the other thing, I, I'm a little concerned about the measurement thing too. Like if it's really that close, do we really have to split hairs? Um, but uh, anyway, I look forward to the uh, report coming back and I thank Randy for his presentation. Thank you, sir. Next is uh, Councillor Gamble. Yes, uh, thank you, Warden. Um, with Randy's comment, and this was something we, uh, Chatra took a bus trip out one day and we looked at it. Um, is there a possibility, like you can see the two tributaries standing in one spot, they're that close. Is there that possibility for those two to be put into one? And, and Randy kind of alluded to it and I've never heard anybody else say anything since. So, you know, that would sure help the cost of this whole uh, event. And I, I would really like to see that in the study and see if that's a possibility along with a cheaper venue of bridges and, and whatnot. Um, it, it is a very important thing. And, and I, I, I'm kind of taken back by Mr. O'Leary's comment. I think we're talking two different things. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I'm a farm background and, and I, I, you know, I support farm venue and I, I just, I hope he uh, realizes where his food's coming from. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Gamble. Uh, next is, oh, so, sorry, Randy, did you wanna add something to that, to that uh, question about the, the, the two into one? Uh, yeah, I could, I could speak oh, briefly to that too. Sure, that'd be great, thanks, Pat. Yeah, because um, we, we had uh, had some, uh, a little stream kind of uh, moving somewhere else, kind of south of Aiton uh, that we had to get permission from the conservation for. So uh, they will allow it occasionally. Um, you know, you have to, uh, come up with a design and hire a hydro geomorphologist um, to figure out that there's no, uh, you know, negative impacts because water, you know, how water is, it goes where it wants to go. Right. So um, it's never cheap either, obviously. Um, but ideally uh, it is something that, that we've looked at in the past where you kind of think the one tributary is quite small. Um, so you kind of think maybe it, it's something that for sure is worth investigating. Um, but again, there'd be quite a bit of engineering to go into that. And it wouldn't be by, say, our staff. It would be, we'd have to hire somebody to do that work because it's quite complicated. But 
um, it is something that uh, for sure we'd want to investigate if, if uh, we were tasked with this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desai, you're next. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, Randy mentioned that, uh, that there is the option of combining the two and spreading the cost of building the new structure three ways. Uh, the question that I have, uh, Warden Hicks, um, through you too, Randy or, or Pat, is if that is the case, if that, that is the way we go, um, how would, who would uh, own the bridge or who would own the structure and um, who would be in charge of maintaining that structure? Um, and, and of course, there, what's maintenance, there's winter maintenance as well included in that. So um, again, you don't have to have that answer for that right now, but, and I'm sure it'll be in the, in the report that comes forward. I just wanted to uh, highlight that concern that I have uh, regarding it. Thank you. Well, I see heads nodding, so I'm sure that's uh, something Councillor Desai that would be addressed in the report if we decided to go that, uh, that route. Um, Councilor Robinson's hand was up, but it's down. I, uh, oh, it's back up again. Councilor Robinson, you're next. Thank you, Warden, and I do appreciate it. I've been having just a bit of um, uh, concern with my broadband, so uh, appreciate the attention to uh, understanding that I wanted to speak. I share um, similar concerns to my colleagues around the table, and I certainly support the um, the motion at hand for a report. The, the bridge measurement and certainly is something that perhaps has evolved through engineering standards uh, that, that could be addressed and the potential for various solutions to this, um, to this matter, but also if the, um, the report can address uh, on a countywide basis how this could be approached and if there is in need of a uh, policy that could address it. I'm not concerned with policy, um, uh, precedent setting as much as policy setting in that it would address countywide uh, issues of, of this nature. Um, so I do look forward to the report and those are my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Body, you're next. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks. I, I, I no time to uh, Councillor Larry want me defending him. I think uh, I think his point that I, it seems to have been missed a little bit is uh, uh, is this really county jurisdiction and county responsibility? And I think that's the first question for me that I'd want to have determined. If it really isn't, I don't think we should be creeping into uh, lower tier responsibility to uh, uh, if, if we don't need to. You know, I go back to that transportation master plan and uh, Councillor Robinson just uh, sort of hit on it about having an overall policy, which I thought really was what we uh, talked about there uh, passed with the uh, transportation master plan in uh, 2015. I recall before coming on to council, uh, then Warden uh, McKinley going around to the lower tiers and talking about trying to uh, get the county out of the responsibility of of uh, local roads and local bridges. And the whole idea of that transportation master plan, I think uh, my interpretation was that it was sort of looking again at the town of Blue Mountains carrying a quarter of the, uh, of the uh, financial freight for the whole county. And should they be, when it's a lower tier road, are they really paying for a quarter of a road that, uh, that, that should be uh, more local than it should be? So that was kind of the idea, as I recall from, uh, the, um, the transportation master plan even coming forward. I almost wonder if we should be putting this off until we've got the bridge classification criteria to look at before we uh, move forward. Um, if it's county responsibility, it's county responsibility. Uh, and, and if it isn't, and if uh, under the transportation master plan, the idea was to try and get out of some of these uh, uh, local roads and things, then it really is the responsibility of Chatsworth and Meaford to uh, look after it. And, you know, this isn't an Owen Sound hat, this is a Gray County hat. Um, so, so, you know, and, and I think that's what Christine just kind of hit on about having an overall Gray County plan, but I think that should have been what, or is what the uh, transportation master plan was supposed to be about. And, uh, I, I'd got a lot more questions and I have answers before we move forward with this and uh, commit uh, from the county level. I do have concerns about us, uh, pres precedent or no precedent, that we move forward after making decisions uh, to try and get out of local roads that we start going further down the uh, uh, down the path of uh, funding local roads. Uh, 
10th Street Bridge or not. Um, um, it's just something I think we need to be conscious of, but we did make a decision as a council a few years ago that we were going to get out of these types of things. But I just want to be sure that it is a council responsibility before we start deciding how we put together bridges, whether it should be two, whether it should be one, or what the different uh, different options are. Thanks. So I'm gathering, Councillor Roddy, that you favor a uh, report that would hopefully address uh, that issue. Uh, anything to add to that, uh, Pat or Randy? No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Potter, you are next. Thank you. And just uh, to support uh, what Councillor Body just said and Councillor Robinson, I'd like to see a policy on this. I, uh, you know, otherwise we, we leave ourselves open to going back to the old days when everybody handed up anything they didn't want to have to pay for or couldn't afford to pay for, they handed up to the county level. And uh, it's uh, a, a slippery slope as, as far as, uh, and I don't mean any pun there at all, but uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure this is the direction we want to take the county in for the future. So we certainly do need a policy, as Councillor Body suggested, and we need to look at uh, what the county should be taking on. And and you know, this idea that it's a matter of inches one way or another, uh, I, I think there's a lot more to it than you know. We're talking millions of dollars. We have a very similar situation here in our municipality. We have two bridges that serve one farm. Uh, we're not asking anybody else to help us fund the replacement of those bridges. They need to be done. They're our assets and we need to manage them. So uh, we're not going to ask the, uh, our partners in gray to help us with that. Uh, I think uh, that uh, Councillor Desai raised a good point about asset management. If the county's going to take on these assets, then the county should have some say in the way assets are managed by individual municipalities as well, so that this doesn't happen again. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I don't want to take too much of County Council's time. A couple of things. I know the agricultural sector is across Gray County. It's not in one or, or other municipalities it, it crosses borders that way so we are looking at a county issue in the sense of agriculture i guess the question i have to pat and i was looking through the reports before the road was closed what were the average traffic counts is it under 50 i know that was one of the ones i think with our our road is there any yeah any I, I wouldn't know that wasn't our road so i'm i wasn't aware what the counts were to be honest with you okay well maybe that's something that could could, could come back through that report I think it's encouraging to hear that if there's a possibility, like uh, I know with elected officials were, were tasked with trying to look at solutions and coming up with uh, solutions to the issues that we were faced. If I think it's encouraging to see if, if one of the uh, bridges or, or the stream could be relocated to one crossing, I think that's encouraging. And again, it goes back to the part that if it's a, a low count traffic road, then certainly uh, reach out to our staff of what we did in Green Highlands and with the solution itself, because there may be a very, other than a process, there may be a very relatively um, lower cost solution that sort of achieves what we want to do and, and uh, move forward. So um, I'll leave those uh, points maybe that can come through the report, but I, I just look at opportunities that maybe we're oversimplifying what we need to do here in a sense of coming up with some real solutions. So thank you for that. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, next is Councillor Keedney and uh, Councillor Burley, you'll be after that. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And just in response to uh, Deputy Warden McQueen's uh, comments about traffic counts in a recent uh, bridge report that came to me for Council, uh, bridges 21 and 22 were listed as having traffic counts of uh, 50 prior to their closure. So just to clarify that, and I just want my final comment to be that uh, the recognition that I know the bylaw is old in 1928, but in any event, that bylaw does state that on a town line, if a bridge meets a span of 20 feet, that it is a county responsibility. So I think that, that's where we sit in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Burley, you're next. 
Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I would hope that we don't, our conversation doesn't, do not get away from our motion we have on the floor before us. Uh, I think that staff report is extremely important for us to be able to base any kind of decision to move forward. So I'm gonna ask for a recorded vote on that motion and uh, I think the motion should be taken, the vote. Thank you, I do see one last hand, uh, Councillor Mill. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and I won't belabor the point, but um, you know, some might consider this a good argument for single tier government, but failing that, um, I, I do recall years ago that there was a debate about whether the county should take on responsibility for maintenance, replacement, and all the rest of it of any bridge in the county over X length or type of structure. Because as, the, as, as, as we all know, the county does have a specialized bridge unit and bridge maintenance and construction is a very specialized type of construction. So, you know, maybe there's an argument here to be made that we re rethink this whole bridge thing and uh, the, the county would maybe take on the specialized work of maintaining and replacing bridges over a certain size or whatever. I know Pat's just champing at the bit to get that one in, into his books, but, uh, you know, maybe there's a discussion to be had there. So anyway, that's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much, Councilor Mill. Uh, Councilor Robinson, I see your hand, go ahead. Thank you. I was, um, through you, Mr. Warden, I am inspired but, uh, by what Councillor Milne has, uh, has just proposed. And uh, I would suggest, if at all possible, could the, uh, the pending report, should it be approved by, this, uh, by Committee of the Whole and then ultimately Council, could it include a discussion in terms of um, um, maintenance and care of uh, bridges throughout uh, county be uh, be included for uh, discussion purposes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for the uh, staff. I guess I could answer that through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, yeah, we could, we could address. I will just tell you, we've looked at that in the past, um, and there there is some issues uh, which would be in our, any report that we that we were to bring forward. Um, one thing is that um, you know. Obviously, if we took on, I'm guessing three times as many structures as we have now, say if you pick three meters as your as your standard or something, um, where do we get that staff? Because um, it, you know it's not like we're flush with bridge crew staff either. We have a hard time getting guys to volunteer to do that work, and and then um, those workers do tend to get more injuries than some of our other workers. So you know if you're doing uh, lower tier work, um, and then we have a guy that's on permanent disability or something. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuances that aren't necessarily obvious at first. Um, but I, but I can see that um, I know, and we run into this too, uh, to tender bridge repairs and bridge maintenance is very difficult. Um, you know, as soon as you contract it, someone gets in there, um, they start going at the bridge deck, they realize, oh, the 20% that need to repair it is actually 80%. Um, so I, I can understand how tendering the bridge work is very difficult, especially for smaller structures. And uh, I do see some merit in the county bridge crew. It's just, um, there is a lot of difficulties in, in um, getting that together and, and making it work. But um, there's lots of bridges in the county, right? Like, so um, there is merit that way, yeah. Okay, um, uh, Randy, I do see your hand, but I wonder if, before going to you, Randy, if I could ask um, the clerk, um, I'm looking at the uh, motion that's before us to receive and then to bring back a report, but I'm hearing uh, a recommendation for a report that in my view goes beyond the scope of what I see here. Is, is that appropriate that, that that be incorporated? Do we need to make a, a change to the, um, the recommendation that's uh, before us? Um, if I may, Mr. Warden, I do think that um, Randy and Pat have taken um, note of all of the comments from council. They have identified um, a number of items to be addressed in there, but they also have an other category. And I think that um, within their report that they will bring back, they can certainly highlight some of those um, comments um, that have been heard by council today. Very good. So we're good to proceed with what we have. Perfect. Uh, Randy, you're next. 
Yeah, just further to related to this, I guess, in terms of making sure that the scope of the report is is uh, is is obviously associated with the the matter that's currently before uh, before council in terms of considering. Uh, first off, you know, who owns structure 22 and then uh, what are some of the potential options? You know, I think in this, that staff report, we can maybe provide uh, some further background information on some of the matters that have been highlighted. But if council wants us to proceed with some of those other uh, larger options, countywide options and discussion, I think that would have to be separate motion at maybe at that time of that uh, that staff report being brought back and then um and then further follow-up and further staff report with respect to those matters just because those are large topics um and uh so we'd want to make sure a that we would have the uh, resource to be able to dig into some of those matters further but also to uh, provide you know all the information that we can to council to make a a decision on whether or not they want to consider, for example, um, a countywide bridge crew that's providing service to all local municipalities. But as Pat mentioned, we've we've uh, we've we've attempted to, uh, that in the past in terms of looking at those potential options with uh, limited success. But you know, so but we can highlight some of that uh, in a in a future staff report if if so directed. But I just I'm just wanting to make sure that we're keeping the scope fairly uh, tied down to the particular structures. Just obviously we've we've heard uh, the delegation and concern from the residents. We wanna make sure that um, we're focused on this, but not losing sight of some of these larger matters and that have been raised to the questions, which I think are all great comments and questions. We just wanna make sure it's, we're not losing focus of, of the matter that's uh, potentially at hand here. I was muted. Councillor Potter, you're next. Uh, thank you. And just to support what Randy just said, I think the scope of looking at the whole issue of who should own bridges and who should own what bridges is way beyond what these, this delegation is asking us to do and way beyond what we need to do. I, I think Randy's got it exactly right. And let's stick to what we're here for. And, and uh, while I agree that we probably do need to review the whole issue of, of who owns bridges and other assets within the county, uh, I, I don't think that's a matter for today. And I certainly wouldn't want Randy to address that uh, in, in the, the time that uh, he would have to deal with this report. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm hearing uh, two views and hopefully Randy, uh, you've got enough direction to <laughs> properly address this. I'm hearing the view that uh, people want it to be focused on 21 and 22. Uh, I'm also hearing that some people would like to have uh, the broader issue uh, addressed. I think, Randy, you're saying your report could sort of um, uh, bring us to some, uh, some topics in that area. And if we wanted you to go, go further, that would require a separate and further report. Am I correct, correct. there? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking at this stage anyways. And that, you know, whether that comes through notice of motion or or uh, following that, that report related to these particular structures. Um, like I said, we'll try and highlight some of the, those uh, background information, the history of some of those matters. Um, and if, if council wants us to dig into some of those matters further, I think that would come through a separate motion on the heels of that, that uh, follow-up report. Okay, very good. I think it's time for us to call the question on the motion before us to receive this report and for further investigation and, uh, and a further report. Uh, is there anyone opposed to that motion? Recorded vote oh, was asked sorry, for, I, Mr. Warden. Yes, my apologies. Yes. Okay. And I will note, Mr. Warden, that uh, Councillor Woodbury has left the meeting. Okay. okay, so he is not with us right now. Okay, so um, if you're in favor of the the staff report then in favor, if not opposed. Uh, Councillor Gamble. In favor. Councillor Burley. In favor. Councillor Carlton. In favor. Councillor McQueen. In favor. Councillor Desai. In favor. Councillor Patterson. In favor. Warden Hicks. Yay. Councillor Klumpus. 
In favor? Councilor Keaveny? In favor. Councilor Boddy? In favor. Councilor O'Leary? In favor. Uh, Councilor Woodbury isn't here. Councilor Millen? Yay. Councilor Soever is not here. Councilor Potter? In favor. Councilor Robinson? In favor. Councilor Hutchinson? In favor. Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will take a break. I'm going to suggest that we come back at uh, 11.55. With that said, we'll adjourn and uh, come back at 11.55 sharp. See you then.
How are we looking? Not quite. There you go, Mr. Warden, you have quorum. Excellent, then we'll get started. We're on next to item 7B, which is dealing with the Hanover, Hanover OPA number three. This item has been moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Uh, Scott, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks, and uh, good morning to the Warden and members of Council and those uh, watching today. I'm just gonna take a second here to share my screen and I will get right to the presentation. So can people see the, um, the map of Hanover that's up on the screen now? Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, so what we have before us is uh, uh, an official plan amendment application number three that's been adopted by the town of Hanover. And this official plan amendment uh, follows in a, in a long line of work that's been done by, by Hanover over the past uh, probably about 12 years to examine their growth needs uh, going into the future. And the town has taken a number of steps there uh, to be proactive about this, including uh, looking at uh, potential lands outside their boundaries to be considered for, for future growth needs. And there's an existing partnership with West Gray on some lands uh, in, in the east end of Hanover, uh, as well as looking at lands within their boundaries and making sure that the lands within their current town boundaries are being used efficiently and are designated appropriately for, uh, for meeting their growth needs. And, and the current amendment before us is, is solely dealing with those lands within the current town boundaries. And uh, dating back to 2010, uh, the town had done uh, a number of, um, of studies to look at, uh, uh, at the time, what was called their future development areas. And, and the planning consultant of the day in, in uh, uh, cooperation, of course, with town council and staff uh, recommended setting aside those future development areas as, as four special policy areas that could be considered at a later date for growth purposes. And there was uh, some assumptions made at that time as to how those lands could be used in terms of percentages that might be residential or industrial or, or what have you. And so what we have before us today is, is, is the further work from that 2010 work to now break down those four special policy areas in the north and south of the town into individual development designations. So what you'll see on the screen there, the, the lands in gray towards the north end of Hanover and the lands in gray towards the south end of Hanover are the lands we're looking at here today. And I'm actually just going to flip to the next screen and what you'll see on this next screen is through this official plan amendment, the town has proposed to, to uh, uh, redesignate those lands to individual development designations, as well as this uh, designation you see in the north in, in kind of the royal blue color, uh, which is looking at the Hydro One lands, uh, including the Hydro One corridor. So there's the acknowledgement uh, that those lands won't necessarily be used for future growth purposes, although things like infrastructure or trails uh, may occur underneath the, the, uh, the um, hydro lines that pass through this part of Hanover. Uh, the rest of the lands uh, have been uh, proposed to be redesignated to uh, a mixture of industrial uses and uh, residential uses, as well as uh, recognizing, especially in the south, uh, that there are some lands that are hazard lands uh, uh, based on, on slope and, and uh, water courses in that regard. So town staff went through the, the regular public process associated with this amendment. Uh, they've also hired consultants to look at the planning, the engineering, the environmental, and the agricultural aspects associated with, with uh, this proposal. Uh, they've received comments from uh, certain public bodies and, and businesses, and I will say that the town has been very um, uh, open to feedback and, and have made a number of changes to the amendment uh, in response to the feedback received. And, uh, and county staff are, are supportive of the process and, and provided feedback throughout the process and, and had some great discussions with town staff in this regard. So what we have before us today is, is um, a recommendation for approval of this uh, official plan amendment. There are some slight modifications being proposed to this amendment, uh, which uh, have been both run by and uh, signed off on by town staff. I will say the, the uh, recommended modifications are really sort of editorial, almost typographical in nature, uh, just some very minor uh, um, um, changes, nothing that, uh, that changes the intent of the overall mapping or policy. 
Uh, as such, uh, staff believe that this matter has regard for, for matters of provincial interest under the Planning Act. It uh, is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the county official plan, and uh, conforms to the overall goals and objectives of, of the, the town official plan and, and gets them closer to uh, starting to address some of their, their uh, growth needs for, for the coming time period. Uh, with that, that's all I have at the stage, but certainly be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you. I always like to see uh, planning matters before our, uh, our county council. Just two questions, if I might, uh, through you, Mr. Ward, and that is uh, the first one with regard to the, the hydro designated lands. Is there any opportunity, um, and I was just looking through the, the map designation there, for any other type of usage other than uh, trails or, or parkland? Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, with respect to the hydro lands, um, existing uses uh, can certainly continue in that area. So if there's there's existing farmers in some cases that are that are farming underneath the line, um, then that can still continue. Um, it's more so the, the lands where, where the hydro has their current station, um, uh, most likely in the near future anyway, won't be transformed into anything else. And we wanted to recognize those corridor lands in that they didn't necessarily need to uh, count against Hanover's uh, land totals in that regard. So if we didn't recognize them in this manner, um, they would be portrayed as either um, vacant industrial lands or vacant residential lands, which would um, artificially inflate the numbers for Hanover to make it seem like they had more developable land than they did. Uh, so what the town has done through the recommendations of, of their staff and consultant is to recognize these lands, knowing that there are certain infrastructure trail and, and even existing farm uses that can continue, uh, but that they're not necessarily appropriate for future development purposes in terms of residential or industrial use there. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Warden, uh, just a second question. And that is that uh, for this official plan amendment, number three is specific to the uh, lands within uh, the boundary of the town of Hanover. Scott? Yes, through you, Mr. Warden. These lands are solely within, within the current boundaries of the town of Hanover, yes. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks. And uh, thanks, Scott, for the report. Very clear, very concise. And I just want to say this process was well worth it. The town of Hanover now has identified every acre within its boundaries. Um, as Scott did mention, we uh, were specifically concerned about the special policy areas. And now we do know what can be developed and what can't be, whether it's hazard or regulated by the conservation. And of course, the utility lands and my understanding is you can also have a road underneath those utilities. So, but this is a huge benefit for the town of Hanover, especially when you look at future planning. If you know what every acre is designated as, when a developer walks in your door, you're ready to say, this is what we have for you. So it's well worth the process. And uh, Scott, I wanna thank you for that report. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Are there any other questions? If not, then I think it's time to call the question uh, on the um, motion to receive and approve with, uh, with modification. Uh, anyone opposed? I'm seeing none, that is carried. So we are now gonna go back and deal with item uh, 6C. And with that said, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, before I begin, I will note that Councillor Woodbury has rejoined us. Um, so a, a point of clarification, um, this, the request from Councillor Robinson is not considered reconsideration under the county's procedural bylaw because these minutes haven't been ratified by council yet. So um, in looking at this, um, I would say that it falls under uh, reviewing a previous question on the agenda. So that's how I've structured it and I've structured um, for council's consideration, a three-step process um, to ensure that there's clarity for members of council, plus any of the public watching or reading the minutes after the fact. So um, it's my recommendation that we first begin with a motion to uh, request that that item 6C be pulled. If that is successful, then we adopt the consent agenda as amended. 
And then we would put 6C on the floor for consideration by council. So the motion um, that would be um, appropriate at this time is that the motion regarding the consent agenda to be adopted as presented be amended to pull item 6C related to report PDR CW 2021, Chapman official plan amendment number 10, and this item be pulled and voted on separately. Okay, so I need a mover for that. That would be Councillor Robinson. I need a seconder, uh, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. Any discussion? If not, then I'll call the question on that. Is there anyone opposed? Seeing no one opposed, that is carried. So now motion number two, Madam Clerk. Motion number two is to adopt the consent agenda with items A through E with the exception of C um, as previously uh, put forth to council. The original mover were Councillor Hutchinson and Millen. So I'm not sure if they would be um, in favor of, of putting their names on that amended motion. Uh, I see a hand from Hutchinson and Councillor Millen, where is he? Sure. Okay, He's, uh, so great. Uh, any discussion on that motion? And seeing none, I'll call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion? And once again, no hand showing. That is carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, the final one then is uh, item 6C, and that's related to PDRCW 2021, Chapman OPA number 10 merit report. So you'll be looking for a mover and a seconder to put that on the floor for discussion. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to suggest Councillor Robinson, since you asked that it be pulled, that you be the mover. Are you okay with that? Yes. And I would like, oh, Mr. Chair, excuse me, I would like to uh, place a, a different motion on, on that particular item. So let's let's bring it forward uh, first, and then there would probably be an amendment uh, to the motion. Um, so if you are not comfortable even bringing this, uh, this just gets it before us for discussion. Oh, um, point of clarity then, um, where I would be looking for a deferral for a certain amount of time, uh, that cannot take place until the item as presented on the agenda takes yeah. place. Is that correct? So you see the clerk nodding her head. And, and yes, that is happen. correct. So we, we put it on the floor uh, and then you can bring your motion to, uh, to do whatever, uh, but we need to put it on the floor for discussion first. Uh, so Councillor Body has got his hand up. I'd move it. Okay, so moved by Councillor Body, seconded by Councillor Patterson. The item is now uh, before us for discussion. Anyone have any questions or items to raise with respect to this? Councillor Robinson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and through you to council. I would uh, appreciate if uh, County Council would permit a deferral of this item uh, so that uh, more information through our lower tier could be obtained and then have this item back on Great County Council for consideration. I would appreciate that. Um, I know our next meeting is October 14th. Uh, if uh, that would be um, appropriate, I would ask uh, the indulgence of uh, council. So my amendment would be to defer this item to the next uh, county council uh, committee of the whole meeting for consideration. And I would appreciate everyone's assistance. Thank you. So uh, then I need a seconder and then we'll have some discussion about the motion to adjourn. So moved by Councillor Robinson, is there a seconder for that motion to adjourn? Uh, Councillor Hutchison uh, seconds. Uh, now we can have discussion on the motion to adjourn. I see hands up. Uh, hopefully those so, hands are with respect to the motion to adjourn. Sorry, more. It's it's a motion to defer, Mr. Warden. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Just clarifying that. <laughs> sorry, the, the legal hat is still on here. I suppose. Uh, Councillor Body, go ahead. I just want to know uh, what information we expect to uh, bring uh, and want to hear from staff of whether there is any uh, impact by deferring for a, uh, a meeting. So Scott. Through you, Mr. Warden, um, with respect to Council Body's question, um, certainly I'm happy to run through the information that's in the report. With respect to, to the motion to defer, uh, I, I guess my respectful question uh, back to Council would be um, with respect to the, the already scheduled public meeting for this application. Uh, we do have a joint public meeting scheduled with West Gray on Monday, October the 18th. 
Uh, that's been advertised both on our website and, and mailed out to, to landowners in the area. And if there was some thought that, uh, that uh, West Gray Council or County Council um, was looking at, um, at uh, um, delaying that meeting date, uh, then we would like to get notice out to members of the public and, and uh, agencies and, of course, the proponent as soon as possible. So certainly I'm, I'm uh, here to answer any of Council's questions with respect to the application before us or the process ahead and, uh, and support in any way I can. And I'll turn to Councillor Robinson to address the question about what is it that you, uh, information you expect uh, Council to receive if we uh, defer. Well, thank you, Mr. Warren. And wasn't to uh, delay any of the advertised uh, public meetings that are already uh, scheduled, but it was uh, the intent is that if there was anything in addition, which uh, was felt that uh, this particular item was looking for additional um, public consultation, uh, then it would be information that I would like to receive through the lower tier, but it is not to address the, the items that have al already been rescheduled. It's just for any additional um, matters or, or call for, for public hearings or public meetings with regard to this matter. Thank you. So is it possible um, that that additional information would come as a result of the public consultation? Or is it something in addition to that? Councillor Robinson. Oh, I was just going to ask you, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Mr. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't sure if it was a uh, planning staff question. No, with well, the way that uh, the motion is worded, it, it, to me it was um, additional public meetings that would be uh, required. If it is something that has already been scheduled through um, a newspaper and through uh, the process, that is not what I'm focused on. It is for any additional um, public meetings at this time. I would like the opportunity to have that addressed through uh, lower tier staff. Okay, Councillor Abadi, anything further there? Well, I'm sorry, that just makes me more confused because it seems to me this is a proposal to proceed to public meeting. And if uh, Councillor Robinson's saying we should go ahead to public meeting, but wants to uh, comment on it later, I suspect this would be coming back to council to uh, consider at some point. And I'm not sure whether she wants her motion to stand or not. Well, that's that certainly is a good point, uh, Councillor Body. This is dealing with any if if there are items that have already been advertised and uh, circulated, it is not to preempt that. But if there's any additional uh, meetings that are coming forward, that's where I would be looking for uh, deferral so that it could be addressed through uh, West Gray. Uh, so, is this particular for clarity? Is this motion dealing with the matters of uh, public consultation that are already taking place or additional? That is uh, where the question that lies with me. Thank you. Scott? Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and, and, and thank you for your question, Councillor Robinson. So this report is, is sort of twofold. One, it was to, to introduce the fact that we've got this amendment to Council, such that uh, once it had been circulated, if, if any of you received any questions or comments via phone or email, you would be aware of the fact that, uh, that staff have, been received, have received this application and are processing it. Um, and it was seeking uh, direction just to move forward with the statutory process under the Planning Act for a joint public meeting uh, dealing with both the official plan and zoning requirements. Um, in this case, and, and in the case of, of um, planning developments in general, uh, what we would typically do is, is proceed with an initial public meeting uh, and, and start to gauge the, the level of public comment or public concern with respect to an application. Um, and depending on, on what was received there and depending on whether or not there was any, um, uh, any changes to the proposal, it could necessitate a, a future second public meeting, um, but that's only really decided after we've been through sort of that first phase of, of public consultation. Um, so at this point, I think from a county staff perspective, it would be premature to suggest that we, we would or wouldn't need a second public meeting, but we do know that uh, by legislation, we, we, we do need this first one and, and uh, um, we would like to, um, to move forward uh, expeditiously with that to start to get those comments as long as uh, council is, is supportive of that approach. Thank you, Councillor Robinson, I'll recognize you just shortly. Uh, Councillor Millen, I just want to explain why I'm uh, dealing with this. I'm going to go back to Councillor Robinson because 
I think it goes to whether or not we actually required a motion uh, before us. So Council Robinson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you to uh, Councillor Milne for the indulgence. I look at the uh, motion, which is why I was suggesting that there be a deferral at this time, because it does say that um, the municipality of West, oh wait, I need to look at this further, that the proposal proceed to public meeting to consider an amendment to the uh, County of Gray official plan to redesignate a portion of the lands from the rural designation to the primary settlement area designation to allow for expansion of an industrial use on lands legally described as part lots 94 through 97, uh, concession one WSTR, municipality of West Gray, uh, provided that the municipality is prepared to hold a joint public meeting in consideration of the necessary local amendment requirements. So at face value in terms of the approval that is uh, needed here, my uh, deferral was to uh, allow time for consultation or, or questions at the local level before uh, support of this particular motion goes forward. Uh, that's why I was seeking the deferral. So um, I'm concerned that there have already been scheduled meetings prior to the consideration of this motion at hand. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Okay. And Councillor Milne, oh, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I just, I just <laughs> um, bamboozled might be the word, but I'm not sure. Uh, I do not see the need to defer um, a joint public meeting between the two municipalities, Gray and West Gray, allows the public to say their piece, so to speak. And, and if and if after the end of that meeting, a, a further public meeting is needed, then by all means, let's let's do that. Um, I, I think Scott said it very well, and I, I guess my first reaction was to say, yeah, what he said. So I'm, yeah, I, I won't support the deferral. I think we need to move along here and uh, try to accommodate Mr. Chapman's uh, proposals. Uh, Randy. Yeah, I, I just want to say I agree with Scott's previous comments in terms of that there will be the opportunity if 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 council so desires to schedule a second public meeting with respect to this. Obviously, we always want to try to have uh, a joint public meeting. It's uh, rather than two separate public meetings. Um, so that's why we always work with local municipalities and local municipal staff to work on scheduling of those. Um, what we may look at down the road was with respect to maybe the wording of motions related to OPAs, like as Scott indicated, the intent is to bring this forward for information to council in terms of uh, making council aware of, of the amendment. Council does have the ability at, at this stage to indicate if they feel that they, there's no merit in, into proceeding. Um, at the same time, we want to try to continue to move forward and, and uh, schedule those public meetings. In fact, it has been delegated to staff uh, to uh, move forward with the scheduling in, of those public meetings. If council or committee the whole today decided that there wasn't merit in terms of proceeding uh, to even to the next stage, then of course we would cancel that public meeting. But um, but at this stage, uh, staff uh, see merit uh, in in the current proposals before us. We want to have that public consultation and, and discussion with. Uh, of course, the Miss Pi of West Gray and missile staff, as well as other agencies and members of the public. And then that's uh, all those comments and then are brought back forward to a recommendation or a final report to, to council, uh, whether or not uh, this uh, official plan amendment should be supported or not. So that's uh, kind of the process currently in the nutshell. Maybe it's maybe it's the wording in the in the motion that we have to explore further in the future in terms of uh, to try to clarify that. But I, I just wanted to point out in terms of what what the typical process would be with respect to this. Thank you, uh, Councillor Robinson. And I think perhaps it's time to call the question on the motion to defer. Thank you. My concern uh, was in terms of the last sentence where you're looking for the municipality of West Gray's. Uh, support in uh, in terms of holding the public meeting. So is there um, information that will be uh, presented to our lower tier for uh, approval prior to this meeting taking place? It's just within the uh, the process and 
the awareness of uh, this information so that all concerned are aware of it in advance. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, through you, Mr. Warden, uh, to, to Council Robinson's question. Um, what we typically do is, as Randy mentioned, we work with your municipal staff to schedule the public meeting, and, and each municipality works on it a little bit differently in that some municipalities like to take a similar information report to their council or to their planning committee ahead of the public meeting. Um, but what we find what most uh, municipalities in gray tend to do is to bring sort of an information report at that meeting, at that same public meeting uh, to, to go over just the sort of non-disputed uh, details about the application, not necessarily to make any recommendation at that stage on approval or refusal or deferral, just to say, hey, listen, we have this application by, by Chapman's Ice Cream. They're looking to do X, Y, and Z and to move forward there. So as Randy suggested, we're certainly open to any adjustments to the wording in the future or, or, or uh, any adjustments to the process working with municipal staff in, in the nine municipalities across Gray. Uh, and I do apologize for any confusion on this one. There was consultation with West Gray staff to, to find this meeting date and to get it on an existing West Gray agenda, um, but, it, but uh, I do apologize for the confusion here. Thank you, uh, well, Councillor Robinson. So with that, uh, that additional information, I will withdraw my uh, request for a uh, deferral based on that information. I appreciate the time that this council took for uh, um, the opportunity to provide much clarity that was needed for, for this particular item that was listed on a consent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen. Um, do you need to comment now that this uh, motion to defer has been withdrawn? Yeah. So I'm just speaking to the main motion then, is that correct? Uh, I think we're on to the main motion. Okay, yeah, okay. I, uh, thank you, Mr. Horton. And uh, just as a, a follow-up to the report, I know it talks about a joint meeting with the County of Gray and, and West Gray, but if you read through the report, you probably most would know, it does have some effect on Great Islands as well, in the sense of access and stuff. So I wondered if, if you could include, could, could include Great Highlands in that uh, public meeting as well, whether just as attendance or however, just, I just wonder, I don't know if uh, through you, Mr. Ward to, to uh, Scott, if, if there was conversations with our planner, it's sort of a unique situation, not to pull back the process, but just sort of what somewhat be included, because this is a county official plan amendment uh itself so i just wondered if there is some thought around that part yeah through you mr warden thank you for your your question deputy warden mcqueen um it's a great point because the lands are in in I you, Scott, if i could uh, well, deputy warden i believe your microphone may be causing some additional feedback there we go okay scott Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the lands are in West Gray, but but um, the current Chapman's ice cream plant is in in uh, Gray Highlands, and the servicing would be extended uh, uh, from Gray Highlands if if there was approval to do so, uh, and a number of the roads that would be used in in uh, in uh, hauling uh, uh, materials in and out are also uh, uh, municipal roads. So the, the county has been working collaboratively with staff from from uh, Gray Highlands and West Gray on this one, uh, even in advance of the application being submitted. And in fact, when the application was submitted, uh, the, the proponent uh, submitted it to West Gray, to Gray Highlands and Gray County, even though Gray Highlands didn't technically have an application there, but just recognizing uh, the fact that it does have an impact on, on Gray Highlands in that regard. Uh, since the application has been received, uh, we've been in contact with, with uh, Michael Benner, the Director of Planning and Development in Gray Highlands, and are interested to work collaboratively between West Gray, Gray Highlands and the County and Chapman's uh, to try to make sure that any and all comments from Gray Highlands can be considered, whether at the public meeting stage or, or whether through uh, written correspondence. So thank you for raising that, Deputy Warden McQueen. It's, it's a great point for sure. Go ahead, uh, Deputy Warden. You're muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Um, so, so the just a question that I follow up to that would be is so um, it's a public meeting. So I would 
think maybe our residents and, and maybe even some of the counselors from Gray Highlands would like to be in attendance to that meeting or, or just however. So how would that process move forward in the sense of just having the, the maybe a special invite to that meeting just in the sense of having an understanding and also having ability from from certainly Gray Highlands counselors and stuff like that to hear the comments and be part of that meeting just or, or somebody or even just to, to sort of hear those comments so then they can also have a good understanding of what's being conversated at that time. Thanks, Lisa. Oh, yeah. Sure, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so Gray Highlands has been circulated, but uh, I, I certainly hear Deputy Warden McQueen's point. So perhaps after this meeting, I could endeavor to, to um, send a message over to both Gray Highlands Director of Planning and Development as well as their clerk uh, to, to just ask that if, if they feel it's appropriate at the municipal level uh, to share that public meeting invite uh, with Gray Highlands uh, uh, Council, and, and then if, if they chose to attend, they could. Uh, certainly, as Randy mentioned earlier, um, any and all comments will be brought, brought back through County Council and, and through West Gray Council in that regard with respect to, to the applications, but we're certainly happy to, to forward that, uh, that um, joint public meeting invite along uh, to, to Gray Highlands in that regard. Thank you. Um... Councillor Robinson, you had your hand up at one point, but took it down, you're good? Yes, I'd just like to say thank you for the clarity in the process. I think it, it defined it uh, much better and I appreciate the time that was taken in order to address this separate from the balance of the consent agenda. Okay, so I think it's time to call the question on the main motion, which is to receive this report and to proceed with the public meeting. Uh, is there anyone opposed? Uh, seeing no hands, I'm going to say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we are down at the end, aren't we? We're on to item number eight now, other business. Is there any other business? Um, Heather, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, a couple things. After, um, I'm assuming we'll have a break, but uh, Jody McEachran has scheduled some cybersecurity training. Um, tentatively starting at one o'clock. Um, it's not advancing the business of the county, but it is just information for council members. And um, my other item is uh, good news, I think, um, but sad. Tara Warder is coming back to us on Monday from her parental leave. So today is Kathy Nuno's last day. Um, as our deputy clerk, she has been um, taking on that role since uh, Tara went off in March. And uh, I want to thank her very much for stepping into this role and taking it on with as much enthusiasm as she did. So uh, I appreciate that and, and wanted to thank her for that. Well said. Any other, other oh, council decide, yeah. Thank you, uh, Warden Hicks. Uh, unfortunately, this, this uh, meeting also spells the end for my uh, bi-weekly tradition of asking the CAO when we're getting back into chambers. Uh, I, I was very happy to see um, that there is the plan to get back in a, in a hybrid setting for October 14th. Uh, and and I, I, there, the words do not exist uh, to express how excited I am uh, to get back in chambers. Thank you. Yeah, we know that you're very excited, but I should also uh, make the point, and I made it to uh, senior staff uh, meeting uh, yesterday, uh, that for some it's very exciting, and for others there's a bit of trepidation there. Um, so we want to be, you know, sensitive to both sides. Uh, some are really anxious to get on with it, and others are sort of. My wife uses the term "peopley," that she finds certain places people. <laughs> it's been an interesting couple of years, hasn't it? Okay. Any other other business? Uh, item nine. Any notices of motion? Uh, Council Desai. Thank you, uh, Ward Nix. Uh, I do have uh, two notices of motion. Uh, one is with regards to um, uh, looking at, uh, I, I don't know if electoral reform is the right word, but I'll, I'll work with the uh, clerics department to, uh, to come to the exact wording. Um, uh, but it is effectively ar around uh, representation around county council uh, table. And the other is with regards to um, exploring the, uh, the cost of providing mental health supports to members of council um, at county council. Uh, I will work with the clerk's department to um, um, 
hope have better wording as uh, the clerk is a lot better at wording uh, wording these than I am. So um, I just wanted to provide notice for those two motions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone else? Any other notices of motion? I do not see any hands. So with that said, we're on to the final uh, item, uh, number 10. Motion for adjournment moved by Councillor Hutchison and seconded by Councillor Burley. Anyone opposed? 